If you don't have a snack and you want one, please help yourself. And uh, you can even have two snacks, I think. Um, and the drinks are up here by the wall if you didn't see those, although we do have coffee over on the tables. So we're glad you're back. How many of you were here last time? Oh, wow, look at that. Great. So some of you are, this is your first night to come to the classes. And, um, but it looks like a, not, not very many of you, so we're really glad to have you back, those of you that were here before. Um, on behalf of Northwest Arkansas Beekeepers Association, I just want to welcome you to class number two. This is the final class of our new beekeeper training um, that we do pretty much annually. Uh, we do have, um, if you want to follow up by uh, continuing on to learn about bees, you're welcome to come to our monthly meetings. We meet right over there on McConnell Road, the, the, uh, the county extension building, uh, every the second Monday of each month, February through September. And then in October, we have a, a nice uh, picnic and kind of a kind of to uh, round out the season. And uh, usually have some games and a honey contest and things like that. So we just welcome you to be. Uh, invite you to be part of our Bee Keepers Association if you would like to be a member. Uh, it's not hard to join. You can do it online, northwestarkansasbeekeepers.com, or you can uh, come to our meeting next month and just join, you know, the old-fashioned like pencil and paper. Do you have a question? First Monday? Second. It's the, the second Monday. Did I say that? It's second Monday of the month. We start in February and we meet each month until September, and then in October is our, our picnic. Let me see, I think maybe I've told you everything. Uh, we really have a more, um, some really interesting presentations tonight. We're gonna do kind of a hybrid of um, some pre-recorded video and also some live presentations. Um, each presenter tonight, just like uh, last class, we have just really excellent, very um, knowledgeable and experienced beekeepers presenting. And I think that's one of the things that our club brings to the table is just a really great group of really knowledgeable and experienced beekeepers. So that's another thing you have access to if you join our, our membership. I think that's about it. Um, let's see, we're going to do video first. Is that right? We're going to no. do first. Oh, you're first? I'm first. Okay, so I'll <laughs> let you introduce yourself. Okay. All right. So anyway, sit back and relax. Help yourself to, uh, <laughs> to snacks and drinks, if I didn't say that three times already. All right, this, well, I'll let, it, let Jay introduce himself. I'm good. Okay. Hey, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, you did. Yeah. All right. Um, sorry, my name is Jay Davidson. Uh, I've been beekeeping about 12, 13, well, yeah, 11, 12 years. Uh, but anyway, what I'm here to talk about is really installing bees in your beehive and acquiring new hives. So uh, without further ado, last, last time we talked about uh, placement of your hives, you know, thinking about where you're going to put your hive, you know, whether it's going to be in your, you know, right outside your window or out in the pasture somewhere and the considerations for that. So today we're going to talk about uh, kind of different options uh, for acquiring bees. David, my picture don't work. Go in now. Oh, there it is. How far to go? Okay. It does work. It's operator error. <laughs> so what I really want to talk about is, uh, you know, you basically have three options when it comes to buying bees, uh, <coughs> practically two. You can either buy a package of bees or you can acquire a nuke, uh, buy a nuke. Uh, you can, if you're fortunate enough to buy the full hive, awesome, <laughs> good luck. Uh, but what, we're, what I'm going to talk mostly about is uh, package of bees and uh, a nucleus hive. Uh, uh, transport, uh, think about when you're picking up your bees, uh, whether you're picking up nukes from someone local or whether you're, you know, you're mail ordering some uh, packages. You want to be sure when you're transporting, you got plenty of airflow. You got uh, secure wherever it is, so whatever it is, not you know whether it's a nuke or a package sliding around the back of your truck, bumping around. Just from experience, I have a uh, mosquito net 
when I'm putting them in a closed-in car, whether it's a fluke or a package, I'll throw that over it just, just in case, because you don't want to be driving down the highway and have a couple of, a couple of stray bees uh, all of a sudden decide they want to take an interest in you. So it's always a good idea. Back of your truck, obviously, you're an open vehicles always fine, but uh, must learn there. With a nuke, what you're getting, we've got a couple of examples up here that my lovely assistant is going to show. <laughs> this is a, you'll, you'll see an easy nuke, you know, a nucleus hive. That's really, it's a miniature hive. It's normally got five springs in it. Well, that's all the box of holes left off to the end. In there, you'll, there's going to be a laying queen. There's going to be frames with brood, frames with pollen, some honey, and maybe an empty frame. So if you get a nuke, you know, some people are new, they go spend $180 on a new nuke, and they go, well, there's nothing on this one. Well, that's supposed to be there. It needed to be there. So don't feel like you got cheated. Sometimes you'll open up a hive, and there'll be so much fur comb and bees boiling out of it. Uh, it just depends on the manufacturer, whether it's package, and that sort of thing. So again, you weren't cheated. Uh, it just, when they make these things up, they have to allow for growth of the hive. It's just going to grow because they have to create these nukes and then they have to introduce the queen. And that, for several weeks, can go by between actually creating the nuke and then actually having it available for you to pick up. But in the meantime, the bees are in there working. So they, they need that empty space uh, to get going. I wanted to give you a little background kind of on uh, how these things are. about these are three just different types of nukes the one that you saw up there that uh, we were showing there's a plastic there's uh, this what they call an easy nuke some still use the cardboard so no telling how you're going to get it it all depends on the manufacturer that you get it from but they're all going to be the same they're going to be five frames in there with a mixture of brood stores honey and hopefully a empty frame for them to go out into but no, when they make these things up, what they do is they're going out into a working hive, an operating hive, it's overwintered. There's 10 frame boxes in there. They're going through their hives and they're finding 10 frames that meet their specifications and they're putting them into a five frame nuke. Those five frames may not even come from the same hive. Those bees may not know each other. They all may have just gotten thrown together when that box got made. So they got all put into that box without a queen. And then what the what they do then is they'll either introduce a queen cell and let the queen hatch, or they'll typically bring a uh, purchase in bulk made of queens that they'll install into that nuke. And then they'll set it out, and they'll set it out for a period of time. They'll come back and inspect that nuke to make sure that the queen that was introduced is actually laying. They'll go in there and look for eggs, and if they find eggs, they know it's all good, certified for sale. And that's, but you can imagine if you're doing hundreds of those in a bee yard, there's a lot going on. Things happen. So if you run into some problem with a nuke, be sure and contact the manufacturer <coughs> immediately. If you see something that doesn't look right, just give them a call. They ought to. I mean, everyone I know of has been very good on customer support, and they'll talk you through it. They're used to dealing with new beekeepers. You know, don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, package bees. These are typically three pounds of bees. You'll find the laying queen holding that up for you. That's what a box looks like. A laying queen with a can of syrup, and you can either pick those up, I think you could, well, it depends on whether you're picking them up or whether you're mail order. Believe it or not, you do order those by the mail. If the United States Post Office will deliver them priority mail. Be prepared, the post office will probably call you and say, hey, you need to come pick these up. <laughs> They're not gonna have anybody that's wanting them bring them to your house. And then when you get there, they'll go, they'll probably point to some far nether corner of the <laughs> back dock. But they are obligated by law to handle uh, bees, I think. It's like a 1940s or 50s law. They have to, they can't turn down chickens or bees. And there may be a couple other things, but that's why when you go pick up your bees, you'll probably be out in the same part of the post office where there's uh, uh, chicks out there as well. People still mail order chicks as well. It's, yeah. So, I think the first time I got bees was on my way to my daughter's soccer game, <laughs> and the post office called, so I had to swing by the post office and pick up the bees and then go to my daughter's soccer game. So, it happens. 
<coughs> uh, but it is a good way to get bees. Uh, my recommendation is typically, probably shouldn't say this, but it's somewhere in the south, uh, southeast part of the country. You know, rather you didn't mail order bees from Arizona or Texas. Have a lot, a real problem with African ant bees, and we just don't need that. We've got some African ant bees here in Arkansas and southern, some of our southern counties confirmed, but uh, most of these are certified and they go through a lot of inspections, so you're probably safe. It's just if you have, a, if you have a, a choices, stick to kind of the south, southwest uh, climate. Uh, oh, and the way these are made. Tell you what, it's unceremonious. They go out and shake a bunch of frames out of these hives into a box, into a funnel. Like, sorry, the grainy photo. A box like the guy here on the left. And that guy goes over to the other guy sitting there holding the boxes and he just dumps them in until the guy says, that's enough. And then they go on to the next one. Those bees don't know each other. They've never been together. They don't know what's going on and they're not happy about it. So they're all getting thrown together. So what you end up with is bees of all different ages as well. When you go pick up your bees, you're going to find dead bees on the bottom of that box. It's going to be a handful at least, and maybe even more. Because when they shook those bees out, they may have been at the end of their life. They may be 30-day-old 30, 30 bees when they got shook in there. You don't ever know. Could be a lot of nurse bees. You know, it could have taken longer in transport than was calculated by the producer. There's all kinds of reasons, but you're always going to find a handful of bees at the bottom, and that's fine. But now, if if it looks like half the bees are sitting on the bottom, you need to call the manufacturer immediately and let them know. They'll make good on it, but you need to let them know as quick as possible. Uh, but again, I, I want you all to know how, how do these things get made. But they shake those bees in there, and then they take a package queen and they stick it in there. She doesn't know them, and they don't know her, and that's why she's in the cage. They put her in that cage to give the bees time to get accustomed to her and the transport. <coughs> So between the time that package is made and the time it arrives at your place, uh, they've had a little bit of time to get acquainted. And then we're going to show you in a minute there's a, you know, there's a, uh, how to introduce the queen into your hive through a package. Um, if you do buy a nuke or go pick one up or you get a package of bees like I did I, you know, on my way to my daughter's soccer game and you can't install it immediately, be sure and Best thing to do is take your nuke and place it where on the bottom board of the location you're going to put the hive ultimately. They'll be fine, and they'll be fine for several days. What you want, what you worry about is outgrowing those five frames. And I tell you what, in the spring with a flow going and a new hive, they can build some comb fast. So they'll get ahead of you quick. So don't don't wait too long. Um, be, and be sure that you open these things typically will come with a, an entrance seal. It may be, a, sorry, that's your job. They'll <laughs> typically be sealed, but there'll be some sort of entrance. These pop out. You know, there's a little piece of corrugated. There, some of them have a plug in it. You can demonstrate that better than I can. But there'll be a plug in it. That's the entrance. You're going to put it on your bottom board, you're going to open that entrance, and you're just going to leave it. That's only if you can't install it immediately. But they'll be fine in that hive, and the bees will start flying out, as you can see. Some of them will just have a yellow plug at the end, and these crawl hives, if you can pull this up and bend it, and it stays open and gives it a slot to come in and out. Does that make sense? Yeah. But you can't do it with your finger. <laughs> you need a pocket knife or a hive tool to, to open it up. But. The same on the pro hives, there's a, a little bit of a different arrangement, but it's just you want to be sure to get it opened up because you want to let the bell start flying. They need to go out to a cleansing flight. They need to go out and get oriented to where they are. You can slide this one up in there. Yeah. Yeah, they'll come so back. On the, on those right there on the, the white box. You just leave them, leave them in that box for a couple of days and then transform them. No, if you, no it's always you best to, when you get them home, you get them in their 2B high, forever high. Yeah, best to, but if you can't, sometimes work gets in the way, family gets in the way, weather sometimes gets in the way, uh, a lot of things can come up. Just 
I'm encouraging you to be sure to put them in the location that you're going to keep them long term because they will immediately orient to that location regardless of the box they're in. So they'll, uh, but they'll be fine there in that box for days as long as they don't outgrow that. Thing. Like I said, there should be one empty that was put in there, but that one empty could get filled up pretty fast in spring. So be careful with that. With uh, package bees, uh, same, you really don't want to keep those very long. I say one to two days max is my general rule. I've had people tell me that, oh no, you can go longer. Every day you, add, you store that is a day you're a risk you're adding. So the bees are, you know, they don't defecate in their own hive and they're not defecating in that box for the most part. So they're holding it. <laughs> and you need to get them out of that box. Uh, but if you do have to, keep them in a cool, dry place and get you a little spray bottle with some one-to-one -one syrup in it, something like that, and spray them a couple times a day. Just don't, you don't have to wet them down, just give them that. They've got a can of syrup in there that should last them uh, for another couple days, but spray bottle is just insurance so they don't start to death uh, while they're waiting on you to get them high. Does that make sense? These, a nuke, has food in it. Remember we talked about they'd have honey or syrup or, or nectar in there? These have what's in the can, and that's it. And you don't know how and long they've been, been on the road, you know, and stuff, so. Yeah, yeah, you don't know how long they've been in that box and how much of that food they've eaten or haven't. So a couple of spritzes a couple times a day until you do get them in without hiding them, always a good idea, again. Yes? They do. We'll get into that in just a second. I wouldn't know. You wouldn't do that until you put them in the hive. Though. Yeah. What you don't want to open. Mm, don't do that. <laughs> We're going to talk about installing. <laughs> we'll get to a little bit of those kind of questions. But with a nuke, it's really pretty easy. I, there's too many people to really demonstrate this. So I'm going to use these pictures as much as I can. But when you get your five frame nuke, uh, and you're ready to get your protective equipment on. Uh, you know, I know everybody watches these YouTube videos, these guys in shorts and t-shirts. If you're a new beekeeper, do the whole thing. Start out with all of it. Decide and learn whether you really like getting stung or not. And as you get more comfortable with your bees and as you get braver, you know. But I've seen new beekeepers watch too many videos and think they can just go out there with short sleeves and do this because, oh, they're all gentle when they're right out of a package. Well. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> you don't want to find out the hard way that they're really upset and not happy with you at all. And nukes, especially nuke, is a full-fledged hive, so they do have something to protect. So, you know, with a nuke, you want to don your protective clothing, you want to light your smoker, and what you want to do is clear out about six frames in your 10-frame box, like in this picture. Empty out the middle, and I say if you're going to put five in. I told you to take six out. You want to give yourself some room to play with. We'll put that. We'll put that last one back in after we're done installing it. But with nukes, it's pretty simple. You just take those five hives. You want to keep them in their existing orientation. In other words, you know, just just move them exactly the way they're in this box. You know, if the entrance is here in the front, then just be sure when you're done, you've got all five of your frames moved into your five into the middle of your New hive. Okay? You'll have frames, new frames on both sides of this. And then you'll come in uh, with your, your last one. I will say when you're installing these, especially if you're using these, uh, if, you're, if you're getting your bees in these easy, easy nukes, they have a tendency to be a little maybe warped on the sides. So if you try to pull one of the outside frames first, you run the risk of rolling a bunch of bees on the outside as you're pulling it up. You squish some bees coming up. Bees do not like smelling other bees being squished. And they do. As soon as you squish one, everybody in the colony knows about it. So they get free. Better to grab the second one, pry it out with your hot tool, and put it in, and then bring the others over. But again, just keep them in the orientation. You know, and if you need a sharpie right on these things, I write on all my hives. People look at my hives and go, what is all that? Well, I, I have various initials and dates and things I've crossed out on my tops of my frames, just notes to myself so I remember what I did and where they came from. So don't be afraid to write on them. Uh, uh, I can't 
can't think of it. Am I missing anything? The Duke? They're just, they're just a miniature hive ready to go. Mm -hmm. There is a big advantage for a Duke over a package bee. Go ahead. Absolutely, go ahead. Well, survival, well, survival rate is what I think is where, where you're headed. And typically, because you do have a working on a real hive, you got five frames, you got a lay queen, you got things that are kind of organized in here, you got food. The success rate is typically higher with a nuke. Having said that, and I don't know that, you know, used to you would do packages because honestly they were about half the price of a nuke, at least half the price, maybe even a little less. And nowadays, I don't think that's true anymore. Right. I think a pack, three pound package would still cost you over $100. Right. You saved about 20 bucks going to the package from what I saw. Yeah. The difference is you can, you got to find, you got to go to Hog Eye Honey or somebody close to find somebody to sell you a nuke. Um, but yeah. But these have no babies in them. Mm -hmm. You understand that you've got a progression already started in the, in the nuke. The day that you set it in, in your 10 frame box, you've got babies come hatching out your, this is just two or three pounds of bees. And then you're, they're gonna have to build comb and they're gonna have to lay eggs and they're gonna have to hatch out. And all the time, a bee has a certain amount of a lifetime. Your, your numbers are gonna go down before they go up because you don't have any baby bees. That's a nucleus hive, which means it's a smaller hive. This is just a bunch of bees. I still think packages are fun sometimes. <laughs> I will admit the last, it's been a while since I bought bees, the last several times I bought bees it wasn't. Good. But once you get, once you get your frames out, you got this empty box, there's still gonna be a bunch of bees in here. Just take it, dump them in there, and then just set this on the ground, right in front of your hive. There'll still be bees in there and just walk away. Come back after dark. Pick that box up and be empty, and you're fine. Don't, you know, they'll be good. But you can just take them out of here. But they're, you're not going to get them all out. But they'll, you know, the bees that are in your new hive, they'll be signaling to everybody that, hey, this is where we live now. And they'll smell it, and they'll go right on into the hive. They'll find their way. Install package bees, you probably don't need a smoker. Get your clothes on, you know, get your, well, yeah. get your protective gear on. Uh, this is a little more, there's a few more steps involved. If, you, if, you're getting, if you're getting packages, you really need to, I don't want this to be intimidating at all. My first bees I ever had, I did have, I had no mentor, it was just me and myself. I was into the, you know, long story, but I just ordered bees. And they came in the mail, and I figured this out on my own. Uh, and I've done it several times since. It sounds a little complicated, but it's really not. Um, when, you get the, when you get the package, what you're going to do is you're going to pry that uh, top cover off. Oh. It has a piece of plywood. You, you're going to pry it off, and it already pries it. Yeah. You're going to pry that off. When you pry that off, what you're going to see is this little tab of some sort and this uh, can of sugar, sugar water. That's what they've been feeding on since they, there's a little hole in the bottom of that can. And what you're going to do is you're going to pry that top cover off and you're going to remove the sugar can. Now, that sounds real simple, remove the sugar can. <laughs> but remember, there's a lot of bees in here. And you don't know how long, I tell you what, I got one one time, it had so much bird comb on it, getting that can out was a bugger. You know, one thing you can do, and bees don't like it, but they'll be fine. Turn it upside down and get, get a hold of that can. There might be wax built, bird comb already built on that can. It's not gonna come out smoothly. You're just gonna pull and Prime. It can be a booger sometimes, uh, but you'll get them out. 
And I, in a minute, I'll tell you what, what to do if you absolutely cannot get it out. But behind it, what's attached to this tab is your queen in this queen cage. She's going to be in there as well. So what I do is I take a can out, slide this back over so bees aren't flying in my face, get rid of my, just set that aside. In fact, you can throw it away if you don't need it. Next step is get the queen out. And that, there are bees all over that thing, they're clinging, you're gonna pull that out and you're gonna move this back over. There's gonna be bees getting out, so they're gonna be around you, they're gonna be flying around. And you're gonna have your queen cage out of the hive. This is what your queen cage is gonna look like. There's gonna be a cork on both ends, and then one end there's gonna be a plug of candy. And that candy is to be able to eat through that candy over the course of the next two, three days to release that queen. The reason for that is you don't know how long this queen has been with those bees. They need to get accustomed to each other. Otherwise, they'll reject her and attack her and kill her. So you want to give it some time. Again, you don't know how long they've been in transport. So they may be very accustomed to her. They may not be at all. So uh, you take the cork out of the candy end this cage, okay? I hope this doesn't sound complicated. But again, there's gonna be bees flying around, so it's good to kind of think through and plan what you're gonna do or how this is gonna go or how you think it's gonna go. Uh, <coughs> and then what you're gonna do is, what I do is I use two, I use rubber band. Take a frame, put a couple, put a couple rubber bands on it, what you want to do is put, I used to tear these tabs off, by the way, because they're even, even yeah, they're usually in the wrong orientation anyway. If you don't put them. But what you want to do is just put it in between horizontally, like that, on your frame. You can see how he's got it. Yeah, that's a better picture anyway. You just want to put it right there. So you're going to place that queen in between, or rubber band it, and then put it into the hive next to an empty. Yeah, you already got the thing. Well, I don't have the full hive, you just yeah, show on the table there if you want. And she started. Yeah, you're just going to sandwich that in between two frames. that simple. It sounds complicated. The cork on the candy end sometimes is murder, so a pocket knife. But I use a wood screw, cheap wood screw, and you just twist that in there and pop it out. And I found that to be real effective too. To get that little cork out, something to pick at it with. Pocket knife works good, but a great clip or anything, but you should get it out. And it, you know, I see some people that put, uh, you know, the way I show you here is to keep it horizontal. What you don't want to do is you don't, you don't want to have the candy end pointing down. Because if one of those attendants that's in there with the queen were to die or something, they, it's possible they could block the exit. So they couldn't, the queen couldn't get out. And you don't want that to happen. So by having it oriented, by the candy plug oriented upwards or horizontally, the odds of blocking that exit is zero. Make sense? Sounds like a lot of steps. Um, once you've got your queen situated in your box over here, the next, I like to give them a couple spritz, your package, a couple of spritzes of sugar water, just to give them something to do. They start worrying about cleaning themselves. And yes, everything's gonna get sticky, but that's the least of your worries right now. Spray them a little bit with that sugar water. And then it really is, it's the bubbling dog. Then you go, and if you spray them with that sugar water, they have trouble flying. They won't they're they're yeah. heavy and they're sticky in there. Yeah. And they're not flying in your face quite so a bit. Then you take this off and you just simply. Yep. 
They really will pour out of there like water. You'll be surprised. They will they will pour right out of there. Now they're gonna be in your face and they're gonna be all over the place. But uh, after what he told you last time, what do you think I what do you think you do with this? <laughs> Still got bees in it. Put it in the front, front of the hive. hive. You just set it out in front of the hive and they, they'll, they'll, they'll smell the queen up here in this box and they'll, by nighttime, they'll be up in the box with them. Okay. Well, one thing about bees, you know, you'll you'll do that. You'll dump them in there because you had an empty, you pulled three frames out of the middle and you dump those in there. And you're going to have three frames and you're going to be going, well, they're all just pop. If you'll just set one at a time in very gently and just I can do it. Just set one in real gently, just let go of it. The weight, mm -hmm. the bees will get out of the way. The bees are very great. They're used to living with thousands of their siblings. They're used to knowing, learning how to get out of the way, and they will. You put them in one at a time very gently, and they'll just work their way out of the way, and they'll settle all, settle into the frame. So don't be too worried about that. Okay? I know that sounds like a lot for a new beekeeper, but it's really... You, you can do it, but uh, what did I mean? Not install your feeder. You know, once you get the uh, whether it's a nuke or whether it's a package, you want to be sure you install whatever feeder you're planning on using. Uh, that you get that implemented as quickly as possible when you install your hive. So if you, whether it's a nuke or whether it's a package of bees, what you want to do is be sure you're feeding. Them. These are just I didn't go into detail. Here's one of the more popular ones. Not a big fan of, but <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah, well, yeah, it, it has like, little holes in, in, you know, and they can come up and, and it's inside of this, and this is inside your hive underneath the lip, so they can go right up underneath the lip and come up and get food. And, One of the advantages of these type of feeders is you can just look out at your hive and see how much they've drawn, so whether you know whether you need to refill it or not. Uh, the, part of the reason that some people, again, you know, start fighting with beekeepers, you know, start talking about feeders again. <laughs> some people don't like bees because they're so close to the entrance that it makes robbing easy. So robber bees don't have to go all the way through the hive to go rob it. They just have to slip in the side door there. So it can uh, involve robbing. And I do add that note about aromatics. I don't know if anybody, you read anything about Honey Bee Healthy or some of these other uh, Things you can add to sugar syrup. Uh, that's all great. In fact, I use I use Honey Bee Healthy. My wife loves it. It makes the whole house smell great. Guess what? It's going to make your syrup smell great too to all the other bees in the county. So you're going to you're probably going to encourage robbing, which you don't want to do with a brand new hive. They're looking for something to eat. They're going to find the sugar. Don't worry. You don't you don't need to give me anything extra. Any other uh, aromatics or, or herbs at this point. But again, do feed until they stop taking it. Uh, bees are not going to take your syrup if there's good nectar. They're never going to chew your pollen eggs or pollen substitutes over the real thing. They're not going to chew your sugar syrup over real nectar. They're always going to go for the good stuff. So they're going to stop taking it when they found. And usually around here, the time of year that you're going to be able to get either nukes or packages, you're probably in the middle of a flow, anyway, a nectar flow. So, you, you know, yep. just keep an eye on it. You want to offer it to them? Like last year was awful. We had a really dry summer, uh, late summer, and if you weren't feeding your nukes last year, like for a couple months, your nukes probably didn't make it through the winter. Uh, it was just that bad last year. So you never know. Just feed it. They'll quit feeding it when they quit eating it. Uh, the only thing I do, apple cider vinegar or something like that, I suggest if you're going to put large quantities of syrup in your hive, uh, That'll help keep it from molding because it will mold. And that's fine. A little bit of mold on the hang. Most of them, my hive covers have little mold on the inside. But the bees, the bees will take care of that. It's not a problem. Uh, the next thing, once you get them in the hive, once you get the feeders on and attached, leave them be. You can, like this guy, you can go out there and watch them, no problem. Just what you really want to do is give them a chance to settle down because they've been mistreated, <laughs> been abused quite a bit over the last. Two or three weeks of their life, so uh, give them a chance to settle down, to orient themselves to your location. Uh, if it's a nuke, you know my advice is a week minimum. Just leave it. Just check your feeders. Uh, other than that, leave it. On a package, you do need to go back in about four days, day four, after you've installed it, and make sure that queen's been released. 
if she's still in that cage, I recommend going ahead and going to start to another fight. I recommend go ahead and release her at day four. If she hasn't, if they haven't released her, go ahead and release her. What are you looking at me? Well, I just, I just you know, ask three beekeepers, you'll get four different opinions. But if you ask two beekeepers, you'll get at least three opinions. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> But, um, yeah, after four days, you know, again, you can uh, use that wood screw again to pull the remaining bit of that candy out. But be very careful. What, what you don't want to do is you don't want to pull that cork candy out, standing over here, fiddling around, your eyes over here, and you get her out, and there she goes. <laughs> now, guess what? You don't have a hide anymore. <laughs> so, you know, you want to do it right there, close to the hide. She'll crawl right into the hide. But, that hole's open and she's there, you know, and you're holding it on the top bar when you do that. So she's going to run right out onto those frames and disappear into that hive. No problem. I would say do hold your hand over when you let her go because I've had one fly off. It's, it, it'll happen. Yeah. It can happen to you. One, one of our former presidents had that same thing happen. And he kept the hive open because they do orient to where you, that's what he was saying. You take that box where you want it, and the queen took off, and she flew right back down to the box after a minute or so because that's her home. Yeah, it's a, and again, you can't move, you can't put your bees here for a week and then move it over there to that table. They'll come right back here. They've oriented to this, and so they, they will not change that. So you can say, well, the hive's right there. So it kind of goes along with, but if your queen does fly away, you might just stand there for another minute or two because she'll probably come right back. The only thing I want to, the other thing I want to say, it can be, a, for new beekeepers, it can be stressful for you and the bees. Don't get stressed, take a deep breath, be calm. If you can't get that can out and you can't get that tab out, get your knife and just cut this dang screen off. I mean, there is nothing, there's no reason to panic or get, fine. Cut it off, dump them in the hive. You got gloves on, reach in there and pull that queen, you know, you'll get a little tab up the top, cut the plastic off and pull the queen cage out. Fine. <laughs> there's a proper way and everything goes to plan and you can follow these step by steps and you'll, see, you'll find the same step by steps in most books or, or on the web. And you know, what we're trying to do is, is go to a, a fairly standard common approach that you know, will give you the biggest opportunity for success in the first year. Second year beekeeper, me and other people, you'll see us do all kinds of weird things with packages and this. Don't try to emulate it. Stick to the Stick to this <laughs> until you get clear. I've seen people, and I've had people ask me about just opening this up and setting it in an empty frame, and they'll just figure it out. You know, take the queen out. And I've seen a lot of that lately. Don't do that. If you really understand bees and understand your weather in your area over the next two weeks, and if you're confident in about three or four other very important variables, that might work for you. I don't recommend it. They say it's, you know, people say it's a lot less stressful. Well, I, you know, just dump them out. They, you know, you're gonna bang them on the ground and they're gonna fall to the bottom and you're gonna pour them out of there. And it's, that's where you need to put. Um, if you order a new or a package, make some of the instructions. <laughs> but, well, you know, they, I, I don't know. You'd have to ask the guys out here at Hog Eye Honey. But there's plenty of instructional videos online. But with a, if you're buying a nuke, you're, you're bringing this home, if you'll transfer those five frames as is into your 10 frame box, put them in the middle, put the other rest of the 10 around it, you're good. So after you put them in your brood box, how how um, much longer until you check to see how much milk it goes out before you put on the super? You know, Wait a week before you touch them. After that, you'll get a you'll get a feel for it because it, it could be it just depends. There's a lot of variables, but they can build comb pretty fast. We're kind of a general rule of thumb: when they've got about seven frames full or drawn out in 
it's time to add the next box. So that next box for you may be another brew box, another deep, another medium, or you know, it may be time for honey soup if you've already got two brew boxes and you're ready to start putting soup in there. But they'll be, we'll cover that in other parts of the class. Yes, ma'am. Um, do you have a preference as to which of the five uh, um, poems that you attach the queen to? No, the, you, you attach the queen to one of your empty, brand new, one of your brand new empty frames. Okay. Your, All right. Your, and, and that's only if you're doing packets. If you're doing packets, you're going you're, you're gonna to get this queen in the cage. If you're doing a nuke, the queen's already in there. Loose. He's just running around. Also, um, would would you inhibit the ability for the bees to breathe if you squirted sugar water on them? That is a method sometimes installing nukes is to spritz yeah, you, you, spritz them on the frames well, and that'll so settle them down too. Spritz, you know, all the frames with a little sugar syrup, a little one to one. Mm -hmm. If you got it there in your spray bottle, shoot it on those. Give them something to do, give them something to eat, you know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. I think we're out of time. I'm getting, we're getting the hooks. Uh, we'll be around after, and the guys from Hawkeye Honey are here. They sell nukes. He can, he can talk to you a lot about how to install those for the program as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> when you're ready to check your bees, Get yourself organized, get all your tools together, um, have a, a way of wandering off if you don't have a, a single place to, to keep them, so get yourself a toolbox or a bucket or something. If you've got to go out to see your bees, maybe you need to feed them, get that ready, because usually you warm up the, the water to dissolve the sugar. You don't want to pour boiling syrup into your beehive, so make sure it cools back down to room temperature. If you think you may have to Add another box on your hive, have that ready to go, the frame, the foundation, everything. Get your smoker, make sure you've got dry smoker fuel. You're always gonna have to check your bees right after a thunderstorm. So you think, oh, I'll just go out and gather some pine needles off the ground, but they're all soaking wet. So when they're dry, gather up a, a bag of those and keep them handy. Um, you know, if you may have tall grass around your wheat, your, your beehives, then uh, you know, get your, your weed eater and take it with you and what have you. When you get there, get that smoker ready, light it up. When you first start, you're gonna be so frustrated with those things, they're gonna go out on you, you gotta unpack it all, start it over again. So something you gotta practice so you get the hang of it. And then learn how to light it correctly. Remember there's a fire in the bottom, pack it loosely, then pack the whole thing a little bit more and a little more at a time until it's nice and tight. Keep pumping that bellows the whole time so you don't smother that fire. Learn to use your smoker but learn to not overuse it. A little dab will do you. If you over smoke your bees, that can be as bad as, as not smoking them at all. Now suit up. You can put your suit on first, but it's kind of in the way when you're trying to work and get, get your smoker going. Uh, so get ready and head over to your beehives now. Before you even touch it, just observe your bees for a second. See which way the bees are going. Some days they'll all be flying over here because they found some really good flowers over that way but they're scouting the whole area. Different bees are always scouting every direction. So tomorrow, they may all be flying that way. Or half of them are going one way, half of them are going another way, but observe where they're going and stand on the other side so you're not in their flight path. If you're standing right in front of a hive and they're all coming and going, they'll go around you, but a lot of returning bees land on your back. You don't even know they're there, they won't bother you. Until you step away from your hive and you take your suit off, and you pinch a couple of them in the folds of your jacket, or you sit down in your, your vehicle and you take <laughs> off your hat, and there's about four bees on top. So you don't want, don't want to surprise any. So uh, don't stand right in front of where they're, they're coming and going. Uh, so give a little puff of smoke in the entrance. If you've got a screen bottom, give a little puff underneath. And go up to the top, gently lift the lid, give a little puff there, set your lid on the ground. Again, with the, uh, the inner cover, you work your way into your hive. So stand out of your flight path. When you're looking at your frames, this is what it's all about. When you see beekeepers checking their bees, you might wonder, what the heck are those guys looking at? What are they looking for? Well, this, this section here, this is what we're gonna be talking about.
But he's saying with the sun coming over your shoulder, because when you're looking at this frame, you're looking down into thousands of little tiny cans. And you want to be able to see what's in the bottom of that can. So if the light is coming in at a different angle, it's going to put a shadow there at the bottom. So if the light's coming over your shoulder, it's going to illuminate what's down inside the bottom of those cans. Hold your brood frames over the hive while you're inspecting. Not like what this guy's doing. If you don't know where your queen is, and you're standing over here, over a bunch of tall grass, and you flip that frame over, your queen bees don't fly very well. They are grabbing, they're full of eggs. So they put on a lot of weight, they don't fly very well, they can fly just enough to flutter to the ground without getting hurt. But if you don't know where that queen is, and you accidentally shake that frame and she drops off in the grass, she can't get back in the hive. First, she doesn't really know where it is. She had never been out before. She's not oriented. She wasn't expecting to go out today. And you just shook her off in the tall grass. She may not ever come back. And you may be walking away from the hive and step on her. I've dropped queens before, and I've been down there on my hands and knees searching the grass. Pick her up ever so carefully. You carry her back, and what does she do? She jumps. You got to do it all over again. So. Hold your frames over the hive if you don't know where she is. Just in case she drops, hopefully she'll drop down into the hive. Also, keep your frames oriented vertically. All the bees on the frame are used to being on a frame. They're busy bees, they're doing their job. When you turn them sideways, they, that shifts gravity in a weird way and some of them may go falling off. But also, this frame, what if it's full of thin nectar, you just poured it all over your shoes. And that is hundreds of, of man hours, of bee hours of labor that it took them to collect off of that, you just poured it all out. If you wanna see what's on the other side, instead of hold it, flipping it that way, take the frame, turn it up on end, and spin it around and then turn it back. So you'll get used to doing that maneuver, but as long as it, it's vertical, the bees keep doing what they're doing. It doesn't matter if it's turned sideways or upside down, they're okay with that, but, but we try not to hold them uh, in that flat orientation. So hold it like that. If you have to take one out, set it down, lean it up against your hive or against the hive stand, keep it vertical, and make sure that only the very corners are touching anything. You don't wanna lay anything flat against the hive. Even if it's empty, don't lay it down flat on the ground because you'll get leaves and dirt stuck to it when you lift it back up. When you take boxes off, set them on the lid. The first one goes on the lid, which is upside down. And then the next one you set on it, but turn it 90 degrees each time that you set another box down. This makes it a lot easier to pick up than if you just stack them all together. Because again, propolis, it's on everything. It's in between all the boxes. You will be amazed at how much they can stick together even though they're only touching in four little spots. Sometimes you'll lift up that top box and everything comes with it. But you can put your foot on that corner and you can yank that one up, put it back on. And the same with the lid. Don't put your box down inside the lid. You want to turn it a little bit. When you're taking frames out of a box, remember that these frames are self-spacing. There's a little bit of space in between them, but there's always more space between any two frames than between that frame and the wall. And if you just yank that frame out, you're going to roll a lot of bees against the wall. You're going to injure them. You're going to startle them. They're going to give off that alarm pheromone, which is going to upset the whole hive. So I like to start with the second frame. Take your hive tool and wedge it in there and break that propolis seal between two frames and kind of shove all of those frames over. There's going to be a little bit of wiggle room in there, but just push them over and then you can break this one loose and you can lift it out. Now when you first start beekeeping, you don't have a lot of propolis in there, this isn't going to be an issue. You can pull them all out with one pinky finger, but pretty soon they're all going to get stuck together. So once you've got that one frame out, inspect it, make sure the queen's not on there. That's the one that you can set down on the ground, lean it up against your hive, or if you've got one of those little frame holders stuck on the edge of your hive, you can set it there. But uh, once that frame is out, now you can go to the next frame. You can inspect the one up against the wall, but there's hardly, hardly ever any action there. But you can take a look at it, put it back. When you go to that, that next frame though, you can slide it into that gap. There's plenty of room for you to grab it. You pull it out, you can look at it, turn it around. When you put it back in, 
you pull it over against the wall or wherever this first frame that you removed, and then you go to the next frame, pull it into the gap, take it out, put it back, pull it over, go to the next one, and you kind of work your way over. And then when you get all the way to the other side, you're done, slide all the frames back into the original position and pick up the one that you had out and put it back in. Put it back in the same orientation, don't turn it around. A lot of times it doesn't matter, but sometimes it will. And the bees have arranged everything in that box the way they want it. Think of your, think of your, your, your boxes in three dimensions. It's divided up into slices, but the brood nest is a three-dimensional ball of brood and bees in the middle that they have put there in a certain way to maintain the temperature, keep the bees warm, and they've arranged the pollen around it kind of as a blanket that goes over the top and on both sides and around it so that those bees can go and get pollen and bring it back to the brood nest. And then they put a blanket of honey over the top of that so when they want that, they can go up and get it and bring it back down. But when you start pulling frames out and mixing them up and putting them in different places, you really confuse them as to where everything should be. It's not a real big deal, but for the sake of convenience, put it all back the way you found it for the bees' sake. Just makes it easier on them especially if we have a lot of fluctuating temperatures, make sure that they can keep their brood nest toasty warm. You know, it's still getting cold right now. So at night, our bees are, are in there huddled together. There's a lot of brood, but they've got to keep that brood warm. There are times when you'll want to rearrange the colony. You want to rearrange the hive and, and encourage the bees to work in different areas, or you may notice that they're not, not doing anything with these two or three frames out here. They're really focused on this area, but they're not touching these, they're not drawing them out. Well, you can pull one of those out, slide it over here, and, and slide two frames apart and put one in. Right in the middle of the brood nest, they'll draw all that comb out really quickly. They do not like to have an empty piece of foundation in the middle of the brood nest, so that encourages them to do that. Make sure they've got plenty of syrup or plenty of, of nectar on, on the flowers outside so that they can draw that out. But if you don't have a specific reason to rearrange it, then just put it back how you found it. So as we can pull these frames out and we're looking at them, what exactly are we looking for? One of the main things we're looking at is colony health. We want to make sure that we've got bees that are alive, they're doing what they need to do, and that is, most importantly, the queen. We're also going to inspect the brood, and of course we're going to look at those worker bees. There's drones in there too, but they're kind of kind of supplemental to what we're really looking for. Um, we're also looking at the amount of space that's in the hive. How much space is there for honey storage? Depending on the time of year, we're gonna want more or less space, so we're gonna add boxes or we're gonna take them away. And we're looking in the brood nest to determine if the queen has enough room to lay or if she's got too much space, maybe we wanna consolidate that. So the first thing that everybody wants to know is where is that queen? And as a beginning beekeeper, you spend a lot of time worrying about the queen. The more experience you get, the more you realize it doesn't matter if you saw her or not. It's great if you do, it's reassuring to know where she is, that's why we like to mark her. But e even if you don't see her, that's okay, because we can assess what she's up to by everything else in the hive that we can see. If you do see her, does she look healthy? Usually she does. Sometimes if she's a brand new queen, she's newly swarmed or superseded, the brand new virgin queen. She looks small, she's not any bigger than the worker bees, and you kind of have to puzzle out if that just happened. You look at a bee and you think, well, she looks a little bigger, maybe, maybe not, but uh, you come back in a week, she'll, she'll put on quite a bit of weight. If she's not healthy, there are diseases that affect queens, it's pretty obvious, but usually she looks fine or they would have replaced her without telling you about it anyway. But we can assess the queen and, and the quality of the queen usually by the brood. This is why you want to look down in the bottom of those cells. You want to be able to see what's going on in the very bottom. And you're talking about something that could be a millimeter long. So if you've got bad eyes, you might want to get a set of reading glasses just to bring out to the bees, just to magnify that a little bit. But one way we can assess our queen is to look at what we call the brood pattern. When that queen is laying, we like this. We want every single cell full. That's an ideal queen. You'll never see every cell. There's always gonna be a couple of, of, of ones that are empty. And there's various reasons why that may be. There could be some pollen in that cell. There could have been a worker bee standing over that when the queen came along and she just went around them. Uh, there could have been a larva that 
They did lay an egg in there, but she did, the queen, and for some reason that egg didn't develop, or the larva did, and it got sick and died. And for whatever reason, the workers culled it out, they cleaned it, it's ready for the queen to come back again next time. But this does not look good. We call this shotgun brood. Looks like it got hit by buckshot. There's no real pattern to which cells are full and which ones are empty. They're kind of scattered all over. And so there's something going on here that's not good. You can't tell what it is just by looking at that, but when you see something that's real lousy brood pattern, you're gonna wanna look closer and investigate and try to figure that out. So this could be caused by disease. There are diseases that, that just kill the larva and the workers try to pull them out and then you have all these empty holes. Later on when it's capped off, it, it really shows up. Uh, if you've got an inbred queen, then she's laying eggs, but the workers know something's not right with those resulting larvae, and they kill them and remove them. Sometimes we have varroa mites, that little critter I keep talking about. Uh, certain bees are what we call hygienic. They remove brood from cells that have varroa mites in them, which is a good thing, actually, but it results in, in a, a bad-looking brood pattern sometimes. So there's various reasons why it may look that way, and you have to kind of learn to assess that and, and go in a little bit deeper. So you want to be able to see eggs. If you see eggs, that means that at least within the last three days, you've had a good queen in there. She's laying eggs, and, and that's a good thing. Uh, we want to be able to see young brood. The tiny brood is floating in a little pool of royal jelly. You can't really make it out on this photo very well, but you should be able to see that in the bottom of the cell. It's pearly white, sometimes a little bit more, more clear, translucent, but there's a little bundle of goo down in the bottom of the cell, and that larva is floating in it. That's a good sign. That means that the queen is actively laying in the last six days, and it means that your bees are finding plenty of pollen and they're producing lots of royal jelly. So they, they have plenty of food that they can feed to them. Then you'll have larger brood, older brood. It starts to fill up the bottom of that cell. These are not feeding on royal jelly, they're being given bee bread. But if you look at them, you'll see different sizes and you'll be able to tell how old these larvae are just by looking at them. So they, they stay in these larval stage for about six days they molt six times, so you should be able to assess the age, and you can kind of kind of tell what's going on in the hive. And of course, you'll also want to be able to see cat fruit. That means that you're about to have more workers emerging. This cell right here has a hole in it, probably because when when the photographer took this this frame out of the hive to get this picture, they were in the middle of capping that cell off, and we kind of interrupted their their work. When you put it back in, they'll finish that off. Sometimes they do open the cappings and, and inspect them and sometimes pull out um, dead or dying larvae, but, but that looks like one that we interrupted their work. So there's eggs, there's open brood, and cat brood. And they should be in about a one to four ratio based on the number of days that each of, of these uh, bees is in that particular stage. It's an egg for three days, it's a, a, a larva for six days, so twice as long, so there should be twice as many of them. And then it stays in the cat stage for about 12 days, so four times as long as, as an egg. So if you see that ratio, generally you don't count every one, but you kind of eyeball it, yeah, that looks right. That's usually pretty good. But if one of these stages is missing, you can kind of help to puzzle out what happened. And it's usually what we call a queen. If you can find eggs, and you can find cat brood, but there's no larva, that means that your queen has been missing for a while, or stopped laying for a while, and you've got a new queen that just started up again. If you can find open brood and cat brood, but no eggs, that means you lost your queen very recently. If you can't find either one, then it means you've lost your queen quite a while back. If you've got just eggs and nothing else, that means you just barely got a new queen within the last couple of days, probably. So. Hopefully, you'll see all of those different stages. How much drone brood is there? Drones are the male bees, remember, and they develop in cells that are larger in diameter than the workers, and they're also a little bit longer. They stick out from the, the surface of the comb. So this is a nice worker pattern here. Almost every cell is full, there's a few empties, but down here at the bottom, these cells look a little different, don't they? This is drone brood. 
and you can give your bees brand new worker size foundation and they'll draw it all out, but they like to have some brothers in there. We think of drones as being unproductive moochers in the hive, but the bees like to have drones. They will raise some brothers if times are good. If they're nutritionally stressed, if there's no flowers, drones are the first thing to go. But as long as there's flowers in bloom, they're gonna be making some drones. And they will convert some of these cells, usually around the bottom and the edges, in the drone cells. Also, anytime you damage a comb, you drop a frame, you gouge it with a hive tool, for whatever reason that comb gets damaged, they'll build it back with more and more drone comb. And so older combs tend to have a lot of drone area in them. The more drones on your comb, the less workers they can produce, because they don't have the room for it. Also, the more drones in your hive, typically, the more varroa mites you have. We'll learn more about that next week. But, uh, if you start getting a lot of combs that get beat up over time and filled up with a whole lot of uh, drone comb, you might want to cull those out in the winter, early in the spring, before they really start laying eggs on those combs. Get rid of a couple of those that are the worst looking, give them some new foundations, so you're kind of rotating out a couple of combs from, from each box every year, and you'll keep it looking a lot better. If you see queen cells, then of course your bees are, are trying to raise a queen, but you need to stop and think about why. We discussed last week the different reasons why. Are they superseding? Is it a swarm cell? Is it, are they emergency cells? So if you don't want your bees to be raising new queens, of course you can cut that out, but if they're trying to raise an emergency queen because they don't have one, then you've just doomed them if you remove it. If they're raising a whole lot of them, you can take some out, you can split hives, and you can put some in, in another box, or you can use them to requeen other colonies. You can provide them to other beekeepers who, who might need a queen at the time. There's different things you can do. Before you just get rid of queen cells, uh, consider different options for them. And make sure that your queen has sufficient room to lay. If you've got, if you just started out and you've got one deep box and you put your bees in from a nuke or from packaged bees and they've been in there a while and it's getting full and they're bringing in lots of nectar, they will start to backfill the brood cells. Every time a, a, a pupating bee emerges as an adult, they climb out of that cell, other bees clean it to get it ready for the queen to lay more eggs in, but if there's nowhere else to put any honey, then they'll start putting nectar in those cells. And so the brood nest becomes honey bound. And then that will cause the, the brood nest to be congested. The queen can't find anywhere to lay. And so they're gonna swarm on you very quickly. So you wanna make sure that the queen has room to lay and doesn't feel overcrowded. And they've got room to put honey in the hive as well. As you're going along, eyeball all the workers. Do they look right? Do they look good? Make sure none of them look, look sick. Uh, this bee has a disease called deformed wing virus. Look at those wings, she can't fly. So it's a very aptly named disease. Most of the viruses bees get don't have distinct symptoms you can really see, but uh, this one does. If you see a lot of these, then that indicates you've got a problem. There's nothing you can do about the virus itself, but it's spread by varroa mites. So we want to uh, eliminate as many mites as possible to prevent this virus from spreading to the next generation. Again, we'll talk more about diseases in our next lesson. So we're looking at food and the availability of space in the hive for food. Well, we want our bees to be bringing back pollen. Pollen is where all the nutrients come from. So all the vitamins, minerals, uh, you know, carbohydrates, a lot of that comes from the honey, but, but all the protein and, and nutrients comes from the pollen. So when they come back in, they find an empty cell, she'll turn around and she'll kick those little pellets off uh, into a cell, and she'll use the top of her head to kind of pound it down like a hammer and mash it in. If you were to look at a, a cross section of comb with pollen in it, you'll see stacked in there like, like pancakes, different layers of, of different colors of pollen. And you'll see that they store the pollen around the brood area, <coughs> so it's convenient to carry the bee bread right through the developing larvae. And of course, this is honey, usually over the, the tops and in the corners of the frames, but this pollen goes around it. And in the brood nest, remember I said to think of the brood nest in three dimensions. So usually on the outside edges of the brood nest, you might have a frame that's entirely pollen on one side and entirely pollen on the other side. And then you'll have a lot of the brood in the middle. So if you're going through and you find a frame that's all pollen, that usually indicates the edge of the brood nest. And the next frames out may be empty or just have honey or they haven't quite gotten there yet. 
Honey is what most beekeepers are interested in. And so we want to make sure that our bees have, have room to put that away. Uh, we want to see capped honey. We want to see uncapped honey or nectar. It's not right yet. We can't quite call it honey. And we want to know if there's any empty space. And depending on what season it is or what time in the season, we may want to add more space. Our general rule of thumb is if about 70-75% of the frames in a box are filled, add another one. You want to stay ahead of the bees. Give them another box and that encourages them to go out and gather more. If you wait until this box is completely full before you add another one, rather than putting more honey in the next box, they may start putting some down below and, and backfilling into that brood nest. They bring in nectar, which is mostly water, and they have to dry it down. So actually, the volume of nectar shrinks, gets considerably less and less over time, so they can keep adding more in. But you want to put another empty box up there and encourage them to, to bring more in. The honey flow is our favorite time of year as beekeepers. And uh, it can also be one of the most frustrating times of year if you're not ready for it. Generally, in this part of the country, in Arkansas, it's about mid-April to mid-June. So a couple of months where the bees are going to gather almost all of the honey they're going to have for the entire year. They'll get a little bit in the, the summer, a little bit in the fall, but this is the main part coming up right now. And this is the time of year bees will draw out comb like crazy. You can give them bare foundation and they just want a place to store all this nectar that's coming in and they'll draw it out and they'll fill it in no time flat. It will amaze you how quickly they can do that. Of course, you can also feed them syrup and they'll, they'll do this as well, but uh, they seem to prefer uh, when there's a good strong nectar flow on. Now here in Arkansas, we do have a, a bit of a summer sometimes, July, August, sometimes into September. It stays hot and dry. This is what beekeepers call the dirt. There's, a, there's not a flower to be seen hardly, and your bees may be eating more honey that they've already made in the spring than they can bring into the hive. So do not take all of the honey away from your bees. They can actually starve to death in the summertime if they don't have anything at all to eat. They do need water. Remember, they need water just to live, but they need water to cool off their hive. And so they can't drink on the wing like a hummingbird. They can't drop in the water. They don't swim very well. So bees have to land in order to have something to drink. So whether that's on vegetation or just on the edge of the water, they need to have something that they can perch on in order to get a drink. So you may have to provide them with water if there's not a, a nearby water source. Um, a lot, of, a lot of people do something like this, carve a little groove into a board. If you've got an air conditioner that drips all summer long, you can put something like that and the water will continue to roll down there and your bees will have a ready source of water if that's not in a place that it's gonna be, be bothering you or anybody else. You can get these poultry containers at any farm co-op, put some gravel or something in there so the bees can land, they don't wanna drown. This is uh, just drip irrigation, so it constantly fills it with a little tiny bit of water. Uh, sometimes bird baths won't, won't work, but if you don't provide your bees with water, they'll find something, and it may be your neighbor's bird bath, and they may not appreciate that. If your neighbors have a swimming pool, your bees will go to that. You wouldn't think they would drink all that chlorine water, but if that's what they find, if that's what the water source they orient to, they may go back to it again and again. Uh, same with hot tubs and, and other things like that, or koi ponds and other fancy water features. So make sure your bees have something before they really need it, before everything gets too hot and dry. You don't want to put water right in front of a hive. Typically, they have a hard time discovering that and communicating where it is. And also, when bees fly out of a hive, one of the first things they do is uh, lighten their load. So if you understand what I'm saying, you put a big tub of water right in front of a beehive, they're going to drop things in it as they take off. So put that a little ways off, but uh, your bees will find it and, and they'll keep coming back to the same source as long as it doesn't dry up. Uh, you can put things in there that float, like corks, or gravel, things like that. That's just for, for watering cats and dogs. You can pick those up. Uh, anything like that will work. Fall in Arkansas is not the, the best time for bees. We do have some flowers, 
but uh, a lot of times you start reading books on beekeeping, they talk about the fall nectar flow. That's northern states. They have a, a really nice fall flow up in Ohio, Pennsylvania, you know, that part of the country. But our bees don't, don't necessarily have a, a lot of fall flowers. There are some things that bloom in the fall, but not necessarily enough to, to make a significant honey crop off of. Some years are better than others. It kind of depends on how much rain we've had through the summer. But uh, your, the herbs in your garden, you're done with all your vegetables, you're about to cut things down, let those herbs go, all your basil and rosemary and everything like that, your mint, bees love that. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of black eyes seasons and other asters and, and things like that will, will bloom in the fall. But there's one plant you kind of want to watch out for. Bees love it. We call it bitterweed. Uh, it's, it's an aster, it grows everywhere in Arkansas. It grows all over the city here. Usually comes up about the end of August. Sometimes a little earlier you'll start to see it, but it's about, I don't know, eight or nine inches tall, maybe a little bit taller. Comes up in every sidewalk crack. And if you live in the country, it's in every overgrazed pasture. Because it, we call it bitterweed because it tastes bad to livestock. Cows don't want to eat it. So when it gets into an old pasture, it, it turns into all bitterweed, and the bees love it, so they pollinate it. It reseeds itself, and it grows back, but the cows avoid it, and so there's more and more of it every year. If it gets into your dairy cows, it'll turn their milk nasty, but if it gets into your honey, it'll do the same thing. So when you start to see this flower come up, if you haven't harvested your honey for the season, you want to go ahead and, and plan a weekend that you can do that. Because if you wait too long, the bees gather a lot of this, it's going to make your honey taste nasty. And when you extract all your honey and it all mixes together, one box of this stuff will ruin five boxes of delicious spring honey. So if you start seeing a lot of this around where your bees are, take your honey off and allow the bees to keep working this. They'll put it in the hive. They'll eat it all through the winter. It's a great source of food for them, but you don't want this in your own honey. Another plant to be aware of is goldenrod. This stuff is great. It starts blooming in the fall, and it goes until it freezes to death. And you'll know when the bees are working it, because the inside of your hive smells like a skunk. <laughs> People call the bee inspectors every fall and say, I think I've got American fowl brood disease. And he'll go over there and say, no, nope, it's just a goldenrod. It has a funky odor. It smells like your teenager boy's old sneakers in the bottom of your hive. <laughs> but that odor will pass, and it's a fantastic high-protein pollen for your bees. They can get a lot of nectar from it. And this is one of the, the biggest plant families in, in North America. So there's a lot of different varieties of it out. We have a lot of it here. Uh, if you've got a, got a big wooded area, you'll probably see a lot of it along the, the edges of the woods anywhere that deer love it, but it, it comes up in a lot of places. A lot of other insects also uh, will, will feed on this. You'll see a lot of wasps and things on it, but great for bees. Fall is the time when we think about pest control. We consolidate the space inside of our hives now. If we piled on the honey supers and they didn't fill them, take them back off. Leave the empty boxes off so that the bees have less room inside the hive that they have to to, to patrol, keep warm, and keep the pests out. You don't want to have an empty box up here and the bees are, are moving up in their cluster all winter long and move up into empty space. So we consolidate them down and we want to make sure that they've got enough food. At minimum, you're going to need about 45 pounds of honey in this part of the, the country for your bees to get through the winter. That's an average sized colony, about 45 pounds of honey. The warmer it is, this doesn't make sense until you think about it, but the warmer it is through the winter, we've had these weird winters where it's 70 degrees in December, when we have weather like that, the bees need more honey when it's warm than they do when it's cold. Because when it's really cold, the bees stay in their cluster and they're fairly inactive and they don't use a lot of energy. But when the weather is warm, it's 60 degrees, bees are outside thinking, oh, it's spring here already, and they're flying around, they burn a lot of calories and they eat a lot more honey, and they'll eat through all of their winter food. When it gets cold, they come back and they cluster together again, and then it gets warm and they fly out. So they actually eat a lot more on warmer winters. So 45 pounds is a little bit more than a medium super, a little bit less than a deep super, so you kind of have to, to gauge uh, 
how much, depending on the, the size of equipment that, that you got, you have to kind of figure out what your bees are going to eat. You should install your mouse guards before it gets too cold. And this is just really anything smaller as about a half inch down to about a quarter inch. The bees can still come and go through these openings, but other creatures cannot get inside. It does not keep your hive warmer, which some people think, but it just keeps out the mice. If you bought a beehive kit, a lot of times it has an entrance reducer. You put it in this way in the summer, but in the winter, turn it over upside down to put it in. Uh, and this is so that um, if, if rain and snow pile up here, it doesn't block the entrance, but also you've got dead bees falling out of a cluster all winter long, and you don't want them to pile up in front of the door and block it from the inside. So it would have to get pretty deep uh, in order to, to cover that up. But this is the preferred way to put them in in the winter. The bees can still get in and out. So we talked about how they cluster together before. You can actually open up a hive and check on the bees without them freezing to death as long as you're, you're pretty quick. If you crack a hive open and, and you see where the bees are, you can actually just look in the top. Lift up the top, look inside. If the bees are all the way up at the top, they run out of food. If you can't see them, but you can hear them down there, you're probably good to go. Bear in mind that bees do not like to be disturbed in the winter. So when you open up that lid and you stick your face right there, they might come out backwards, full speed. So be aware, put on a veil before you do that. You might surprise some bees. But going into the winter, in the fall, the ideal situation is that the brood is down here and the bees will cluster on the, the remaining brood in the winter time or when it gets cold at night. They might be active in the day, they'll loosen up, but at night they'll cluster down on that. Of course, the queen is laying fewer and fewer eggs as, as you get closer to winter, but there's still a little brood patch in there for a long time. And we want all that food up here because the cluster moves up. Heat rises, the bee cluster moves up with it. They never move down in the winter. So if your bees start clustering here and you've got a ton of food in the bottom, they're gonna starve to death because they're probably not gonna move down. We kind of talked a little bit about how they work inside of a tree. So, you know, they have honey in the top, brood in the bottom, there's a blanket of pollen. Down here at the very bottom is where they would produce queens, usually drones down here at the bottom too. So wherever that, that brood is, at, at the end of the, end of the fall, that's where they cluster together. And that cluster begins to move up and they consume that honey as they go. So in the spring, when that cluster breaks up, the queen is up here, that's where she starts laying eggs. Even before it gets too warm, she starts producing a little brood patch and she's gonna kind of wander down as she goes. And of course, as they bring in more nectar, they put it at the top and we kind of talked about how they, they push that, the queen's activity down. But this is what they do in nature, so this is what we want to mimic. Your job in the winter is to leave them alone. They work hard, let them have their, their winter vacation. Occasionally, check their food stores. You can walk up to a hive and you can tilt the whole thing back. If it feels really top heavy, that's good. You can take a peek under the lid. If you see them at the top, like I said, they're running out of food. If you know they're in there, you can hear them buzzing, but you can't see them, then they've probably got food above them, so that's good. Do remove any snow and ice, blocking the entrance down there, but everything piled on top, don't worry about that. That's, that's just uh, extra insulation. A lot of northern beekeepers wrap their hives with tar paper and insulation and stuff like that. It's not necessary in the south because our winters are not that long and not that brutally cold. You'll often see northern hives with holes in them called auger holes uh, for ventilation. It lets out humidity. That's a good thing. It doesn't necessarily chill the whole hive because they're, they're just eating that cluster. But it also gives the bees an opportunity to go out and take a cleansing flight and come back in on uh, days that it's sunny so that they don't have, to, don't have to hold it all winter long, which they will do for a long time if, if they have to. But on a bright day, it's not uncommon to see them fly out, make a quick trip, and come back in because there's no indoor plumbing inside that hive. <laughs> so beekeepers don't have a whole lot to do in the hive, but put your feet up. Get a nice cup of cocoa and think about your first year with your honeybees. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Hopefully you learned a few things. 
Your bees probably did exactly the opposite of everything I'm telling you tonight. And you're going to think that I don't know what I'm talking about. Maybe you changed some things. You read up, you thought about different things, you watched a few uh, YouTube videos, you talked to some other beekeepers, so you think, maybe I'll do this or that next year. Maybe I'll expand. I had so much fun, I'm going to get two more hives this next year. So don't forget to order early. Record keeping is a, a great idea. It's a good habit to get into. A lot of useful information you can refer back to until it really all just gets ingrained. But even, even if you've been doing this for a long time, uh, it's good to keep records if, if you're that kind of kind of person. When you inspect a hive, write down what you saw. Write down what you did. I added a super today. I put on the queen scooter. I took it off. I split the hive. I did this or that. How much honey did you get? When did you harvest your honey? Maybe you have different hives in multiple locations. So how, uh, how much honey did you get in yard one versus in yard two? Maybe next year, I'm gonna move two of those hives over to that yard because it seems to be a lot more flowers in that yard 10 miles away. You can see a real difference. Maybe the honey just tasted different. Where did you get your queen? You ordered them from a different company or a different breeder. Maybe it was a swarm. Maybe you raised that queen yourself. From which hive? Some hives have better genetic stock than others. So if, if you want to raise your own queens, think about which hive is your favorite. It's the healthiest. It's the most productive. That's the one that you want to raise queens from. Did it cost you any money? Well, probably spent a little bit. Did you make any money? Hopefully you got a little honey to sell. Maybe not the first year, but hopefully uh, you, can, you can try to break even after a few years of this. And uh, Uncle Sam always likes it if you keep records of that. <laughs> One of the most important things that you can keep track of is what's in bloom. Every time you see a flower in bloom, make a mental note, write it down in your little bee notebook. You've got the date on there, then go and look at your beehives and see what are your bees doing. Every year the same things bloom again and again in roughly the same order. There are certain plants that bloom really early, middle of spring, late of spring. Your bees are always doing the same things in more or less the same order. And pretty soon you're going to start to see, oh, that tree's in bloom. I know what my bees are doing. This is forsythia. Common yellow flower, bush. You see it all over the place here. Honeybees don't like it. Well, they don't dislike it, but they don't get any nectar from it. There's a lot of little tiny native bees that I see on it, but I never see a honeybee on it. But I know when the forsythia blooms in my neighborhood, my bees are making drones. They're just starting. So I know that swarm season is approaching when that big yellow bush starts to bloom. So I don't even have to go in the hive to know I've got to get everything ready. I've got to get some swarm traps ready. I've got to get ready to make splits. I've got to make my plans. So when I see that bush, that means I've got to start working on certain things. Different parts of the country, you're going to have different flowers that you're going to pay attention to, but that's one of the ones that, that I key in on in my particular neighborhood. You're going to learn about what grows around you, and, and you're going to start to, to learn what bees are doing when different things are blooming for you. You can record things on paper. Uh, you can also get some fancy computer hardware. This is what they give us at the extension office to work on. <laughs> the tax dollars that work there. There are a number of record keeping programs that you can get just for beekeepers. Uh, you can get them to, to go on your phone or on your, on your computer. There's Hive Tracks and Bee Type and Ava Manager. There's a bunch of them. Uh, there's more of them all the time. Some of them are better than others, but everybody likes different things. Uh, remember when you take your phone out there, though, and you start swiping around on your $900 smartphone that you're going to smear propolis all over it. Get stuck on all the buttons, so you might want to write it down on paper and then input it all later on. Video how to create hives out here. Honeybees are living creatures that can get sick, just like anyone else. And unfortunately, you can't probably take a colony of bees to the vet. 
If you do, you're not going to be welcome back there with your cat and dog. And and there are some veterinarians that will come and, and visit you, your farm, but uh, you are going to have to learn how to diagnose a lot of things on your own. Remember that honeybees can travel outside the hive for quite a distance. We kind of consider three miles to be sort of that, that limit. They can go farther than that if they need to. They've been tracked, I think, up to seven miles in the other situation where resources are, are few and far between. But three miles is a, a pretty good radius for a hive. And as long as there's food, they're going to stay a lot closer than that within a mile or two. So within that three mile radius, of course, there's a lot of flowers, but there are also other beehives. And bees, being the friendly neighbors that they are, they may go and investigate other hives. Especially in the summertime when things are hot and dry and there's not a lot of wildflowers in bloom, then honeybees uh, occasionally will do something called robbing. We don't like robbing behavior because uh, that means that another hive may steal all the honey from your bees. So we want to protect our, our weak colonies, those with small populations, so they don't get robbed out, but it does happen. And your bees may rob out some other hive that they find. It's just what bees do. Uh, so also within the same territory around our beehive, there are still feral colonies, not nearly as many as there used to be, and they don't necessarily last as long as, as we would like them to sometimes, but they establish some swarms all the time in trees, in buildings and other things, and, and so they may be out there as well. Now, of course, you guys are gonna have excellent bees because you're so well educated after the end of tonight's lesson. But the poor bees that live in this tree, no one's looking out for them. And somehow, uh, some condition got into that hive and they began to, uh, to get sick and die off. And as a result of, of the population shrinking, they didn't have enough guard bees to protect all of their honey. And so what happened? Your bees came over to visit and took that honey home, but they also may have taken home uh, different bacteria, different parasites, uh, whatever they might have happened to find in there uh, due to this robbing behavior. And perhaps you went away on vacation thinking your bees are great. You spent a couple of weeks uh, having a great time. You came back and your bees are not looking too good because they're getting weak then someone else's bees come over to visit and they take that as well. And if uh, you've got multiple beehives within one bee yard, then those conditions can sometimes drift from one colony to another. But you can see how these things can move several miles at a time. This is why we have apiary inspectors, and this is why they like to have everyone's uh, bee yards on a map where they know where they are. So if something contagious does have an outbreak, they can look at that map and they can see who's within range of that, that we might need to go and inspect those colonies or at least uh, alert them to it. And as a beekeeper, if you've got more than one hive, a lot of times we move things around. We move frames of brood from one hive to another. We might take a honey super off of one hive and put it on another. And so sometimes we are responsible for moving things around. Some things are so contagious, just using your hive tool in more than one hive can spread things around. So we do want to be careful and mindful of some of those things. It's great that we have apiary inspectors. These are professional be lookers. They come to your place, they make house calls at your farm, and they can guide you through uh, any potential problems that you're having, but we've only got two of them, and they have to cover the whole state. So this time of year, they're really busy, and uh, you have to get on their schedule sometimes, and you, you may have to wait a week or two for them to uh, make their route through the state and get back to you. And that's why you have to pay attention and be your own first bee inspector. If you encounter a situation you don't understand, you can't recognize it, you're not sure what's going on, you can always uh, get help from other people. I'm available. I, I sometimes diagnose via cell phone photos and, and things like that, but it's really great if you can get somebody there in person if you really need that help. Start out just knowing what a healthy hive looks like. Start out with brand new equipment, start out with healthy bees, and you're going to watch them grow. They're going to start small. You're going to see how that queen starts to produce brood, how that brood pattern spreads, how they grow out the comb, how they begin putting pollen in there, how they begin putting in the nectar. You're going to watch that whole colony grow. And then when things look weird, when things look off, you're going to be able to recognize, hey, something doesn't look normal there. And you'll be able to investigate uh, a little bit deeper and try to figure out what's going on.
Okay, after having heard John about bee health, we have some issues in our bee colonies, which is called the Varroa destructor. And John has mentioned Varroa several times. When I prepared this presentation, Earl mentioned to me, he says, don't scare the people. <laughs> but you guys are happy, right? <laughs> and happy people are not easily scared. But you will see now a little bit what the Varroa destructor is doing to our hive colonies, and not only in the United States, worldwide, uh, when it started, and, and what we can do about it. So this is um, the Varroa mite. It's, uh, it's just like a dick. And most mites and ticks live in the soil. Uh, some are parasitic on, uh, on uh, animals uh, and insects. And here we talk about uh, the bees. Um, the adult female Varroa mite is, is very small, but visible with the naked eye. It's 1.1 millimeter. Uh, long 1.7 millimeter or 0 0.07 inches wide. It has uh, four <laughs> free IPX, okay? And uh, the female mite is much larger than male mite. The male mite is smaller, yellowish, is only 0.8 millimeters in di diameter, and normally stays in the cell, fertilizes the sisters, and then dies off when the bee emerges from the cell. I think we have to do it like this. Okay, so uh, the Varroa mite is basically the natural host of the Api Sarana, which is the Asian uh, honeybee. Uh, and it feeds mainly on brood and adults. We also have a tracheal mite. Um, we don't talk a little bit too much about it. It's also coming from Asia, um, from the Api Sarana, uh, and it affects mostly adult bees. In general, I think the tracheal mite we control um, with a lot of the different treatments. The Varroa mite is the more difficult one and is also the external might uh, that we encounter. When you compare the Varroa mite in relation to the bee size, it's like a tick the size of a fist. So if you take the bee weight, and I have it here in milligrams, 160 milligrams, and you define it by the Varroa mite weight, which is 0.453 milligrams, you have a ratio of 253. So if a human weight is 176 pounds, a normal person, divided by 253, so you have a mite or a tick that weighs a half a pound or 226 grams. And that is tremendous. So you can imagine that this Varroa mite is a really burden to our honeybee. And here you see those mites, uh, and a bee can have only one, but can also have several. And these mites really reduce the lifespan and the efficiency, the honey production that these worker bees uh, should produce yeah, uh, in our hives. We have different species complex. Uh, Dr. Anderson in Api Mundo in 1999, uh, he concluded that the Varroa mite is not only one species, but are several species. Uh, and only one of those Asian Varroa mite species really jumped uh, onto the European uh, honeybee. Uh, Russian um, migration of people towards the east brought the European honeybee to Asia, uh, and later those same Russian uh, brought the European honeybee back to Europe but not only the, the, the bee colony, also the Varroa mite, 
uh, and with that started the worldwide infection um, of, of this parasite. The original varroa mite was uh, called uh, varroa Jacobsoni. It was discovered in uh, Indonesia. It is much smaller and basically cannot reproduce on the brood of the Apis uh, mellifera, which is the European honeybee. Um, so basically, we have two types of varroa mite. We have the Korean one, which is the, the bad one that has affected the Apis uh, mellifera or the European uh, honeybee. And then we have in the Indonesian one, the Japanese, the Taiwan, which basically is the original smaller varroa mite, uh, Jacobsoni. <coughs> uh, the history, so the Jacobsoni was discovered in uh, 1904 in Java by a Dutch investigator, Oudemans. And then we, it pops up in 1950 in Korea, then in Japan in 1958, in the United States in 1987, and with uh, so much commercial um, uh, contacts, uh, what we have nowadays worldwide in our world economy. Yeah, nowadays, uh, the Varroa mite has spread even to areas like uh, New Zealand and Australia that have for a long time been free of this parasite. So we have it nowadays worldwide. It feeds on the hemolymph, or basically the blood of uh, the bees, and uses also bee body fat. Um, and it's not only that it sucks a little bit the, the life and the energy out of the bees, it also indirectly injects viruses into that um, hemolymph circul circulatory stream. And with that, the colonies become uh, infected with different viruses. And that could have been one of the reasons why a lot of our bees worldwide in the colony collapse disorder uh, have been affected from. So again, uh, the natural host is the Apis sarana, the Asian bee, that has where the mite has coexisted for millennia. And then when it came in contact with the European honeybee uh, that had no protection, uh, we saw yeah, that uh, it had very little tolerance. Uh, the European bee has less grooming, it has considerably less hair, so the mite can grab much easier on the body of the uh, European bee. Um, the European bee is also uh, larger than the Apis arana. Um, so basically it has been the biggest threat that we have encountered in the last uh, 20, 30 years worldwide. We have a very fast spread of the Varroa, um, basically because we are creating uh, uh, more and more hives in our bee yards. We like to see 60, 80,000 bees in our hives so that we produce a lot of honey. And with more replication, with more reproduction, you know, the Varroa mite invades uh, many more cells and re reproduces themselves too. <laughs> Commercial beehives uh, can maintain extremely damaging infestation because we have hundreds or thousands of hives uh, in a certain area. Uh, so they transmit the mite from one hive into the other. The slower development, the root <coughs> development of the uh, European bee has also helped to create more mite reproduction compared with the Apis sarana, the Asian honeybee. So once introduced in a region, the mite spreads uh, very quickly between colonies. Um, also due to swarming, robbing, and drifting. John mentioned this already. Uh, contact between the drones uh, outside the bee garden. So when two bee gardens cross over into each other, you know, bees can uh, visit your bee garden and transmit indirectly the mite and with the mite also virus diseases. Transport of secondary horses to the bumblebees is also, uh, could be a factor. Um, I normally see in my garden a lot of uh, bumblebees, although in the last few years that has come down uh, quite a bit. Um, so uh, in certain states the bumblebees are also um, uh, in reduced numbers present nowadays. Road transport from commercial uh, beekeepers, um, 
uh, that go from one state into the other state, uh, they always leave some bees behind that could be infected and then transmitting uh, the mite infestation to newer areas. When one buys uh, infested uh, colonies, yeah, uh, you need to have an inspector go through your colony whenever you buy an existing hive to be sure that you really uh, get the top quality and the lowest mite infestation possible. The mites uh, are presently everywhere. Uh, we need to control its population. Unlike bacteria and viruses, um, the spread of the varroa does not cause immunity, it's an external parasite. With the COVID-19 uh, issue, we could get a vaccination, we would produce immunity with this external parasite. We need to be on our toes all the time, just like rodent uh, uh, infestation in big cities or in, uh, in, 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 in local farms or houses. You need to control them all the time. There are few resistant strains of the European honeybee against the, uh, the varroa mite, so reinfestation occurs all the time. The mite has spread uh, to wild honeybees. Uh, this could be a reservoir or reinfestation. Okay, and here you see again uh, this uh, uh, the. the the mite on top of uh, a bee on the right side. Uh, we call this the phoretic stage, yeah, where the mite is really uh, uh, walking around with the bees in the hive. And then on the lower part, you see that the mite invades uh, the brood cells. And later on, we go more closely into that, yeah, uh, where it reproduces. Here you see a few of these mites, white, are which the are the smaller stages. Are those the males, the clear? Well, the males, the males are smaller, but also uh, in the beginning, the females are, uh, are white in color. I'll show you pictures. So here we have this uh, varroa mite again. Uh, you see uh, a lot of hair. Um, if they drop on a screen uh, or uh, through a screen bottom board on a sticky board uh, and you don't put some grease on it, you can clearly see them walking yeah, over that uh, board. So some background of the Varroa mite uh, lifespan between 25 days and 5 months. Mites do not have eyes. They get around recognizing pheromones, chemicals that float in the air. It knows its location from the smell. Yeah, mites get chemical signals from the bees when they start invading bee cells and start mite reproduction. The more brood cells, the more invasive are the mites, and freshly kept brood cells activate immediately oogenesis or the reproduction yeah, in female mites. The female mites will produce two to three female offsprings from drone cells. <coughs> and on one or two viable uh, females from worker cells. This is the phoretic stage. Um, so even when we have um, brood in a colony, the, on the phoretic stage, the mites will stay five to 11 days on the bees, uh, hopping around, uh, spreading viruses when they feed. And when they jump from one bee into the other, they could miss and fall down and fall down on the sticky board in case we have a sticky board uh, below our screen button board and then we can count the mites. And that is something that we try to do regular, at least once a month, in order to have an idea what is the infestation rate yeah, in the hive. Then we have the reproduction in the sealed brood cells. Uh, the female mother mite will start laying her first egg 70 hours or almost three days after the cell is kept. Um, the first egg will be a male, and that male will fertilize the female sisters that emerge later, normally 30 hours later. The young female mites 
are already mated when they emerge from the cell yeah, together with the uh, mother mite and, and with the bee. And the mother mite can do a reinfestation seven times over. In that same cell, if you have also several mother mites okay, that compete a little bit uh, with the feeding grounds uh, on the pre pupa. So males and are white uh, and females underdeveloped, uh, and normally the males and the white females that are not fully developed, they will die when the cell is open, the bee emerges, they uh, are dehydrated uh, after that. Here you see those uh, different male mites on the right corner. Uh, the two small ones are male mites. Then you have a white female mite that is completely underdeveloped. Then on top you have a female mite that is developed. And on the right upper side you see the mother mite. So this is the most difficult slide uh, in, in the presentation. And here basically um, you can see uh, the whole development. Uh, on top again, we have all female mites. White ones are underdeveloped, then uh, the completely developed one, and at the right side, the mother mite. There is a small table with the incubation process of the queen. The queen takes 16 days to develop and emerge. A worker be at 21 days and a drone 24 days. You have heard that the mice prefer drone brood. And I'll explain you why. So in the process, the queen first day lays her egg. The egg stands right uh, straight up. then falls down and by three days the nurse bees are feeding the emerged larva. So those are the first three days from start till larva, three days. Then you double that and you heard that John mentioned it, six days from three plus six is nine. At nine days the cells are kept. And then you add double again, 6 plus 6 is 12, 9 plus 12 is 21. So at 21 days we have the worker <coughs> be emerging from the cell. So before 9 days, before capping, at 8 days the mother mite, because of pheromones from the brood, will get into the cell she will go to the bottom of the cell and she will make an incision, a wound in the pre pupa. All the mice, also her offspring, will feed from that wound. If two mother mice or three mother mice would invade that cell, they will all feed from that same wound. But now there will be competition. They will need to stand the line to feed. And that could help maybe to reduce that less mice get to the adult stage and be viable. So, I also mentioned that when the mother mite gets into the cell, she needs 70 hours or three days to produce the first egg. So if we are at 8, 8 plus 3 is 11. 30 days, that first act is a male. And that male will never leave the cell. Then 30 hours after that, she will lay her first female act. So 11, let's say, on 12, 12 and a half days, the first female act is produced. And that female act needs eight days to develop. So 12 plus eight is 20. And at 21 days, the bee emerges. So that is the reason why in a female cell, in a female worker cell, 
we only get one or two female mite offspring. But if the mites go into the drone brood that stays till 24 days, they have the possibility to produce one or two extra adult developed female mites that emerge with the bees and can increase with that the mite population in your hive. So how do we control it? Monitoring and integrated pest management. So first you need to know your infestation threshold. So you need to check your hives once a month. There are different methods. The options, the first one is, I use the mite drop on a sticky bottom board that I placed below uh, the screen bottom board. It is not as accurate but it gives me an idea, an idea, and with practice, you are going to find out that, for example, one or two mice per day drop is a threshold in spring. In the spring, when you want to have very few mice in your hive, okay? because normally you do your treatment in the winter months, we, we get to that. But at the end of the summer, if you have 10 mites dropping in one day on your sticky board, okay, you are still okay. So this has many advantages. You don't need to go into your hive to disturb uh, the bees. Uh, there's no killing of bees. Uh, you confirm if there's a lady queen uh, because you can see how dirty your sticky board is. Okay? I will show you some, some pictures. You can see if there are intestinal problems in the hive, if there's some diarrhea. You can see if there are moth larvae yeah, on your sticky board. So you can also see if you have problems with hive beetles or with moth in your hive. Then you have the sugar roll method. Um, if basically you gather 300 bees in, uh, in a jar with powdered sugar, you shake that very well and 12 to 25 mites is a threshold. Okay, and then you can also use alcohol. You will kill the bees, but this is very accurate. All the mites will come off the bees and you can count and calculate your percentage. So here you see uh, a, a, a sticky board uh, where we have a fairly severe infestation rate. You see all these black dots Okay, are all uh, mites. Uh, so you have only in this area here around 30 mites. So this whole sticky board um, uh, has quite a bit. You can also check for hive beetles. Uh, here's another one where we have 616 <laughs> mites. Okay, um, and my better half in the back of the, half of the, of the class, she helps me uh, counting these mites. Um, because I like to know exactly, you know, what is happening in the hives. So here we have 148 miles, miles in this piece of sticky board. You can also use uh, one with squares. Normally you buy them, they come. Uh, it's easier to count them, but when you clean them, often the, 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 the markings come, come off, which you see in uh, on the site, so uh, you use them fairly frequent and uh, you will need to redraw your mice. Uh, try to count the mice every 24 hours, maximum 48 hours, so that you don't get too much dirt on your uh, um, sticky board because it will be more complicated the counting. I repeat it normally for one, two or three days. Okay, so you have a repetition of what you see and can rely on that data on hot days you can more bee activity in the hive. You could have more natural drop. Um, and, and again, counting mice will give you an overall idea on the condition of the hive. So here you see uh, the lines between the frames. So if you uh, check your bottom board after three days, you could see uh, this type of, uh, of, uh, of concept. Here you have very few mites, but you see this is a very active hive. 
And you can also look over here, you see much more pollen, which will indicate that over there there's much more brood, so the bees are more concentrated to one side yeah, of your hive. If you use the alcohol method, uh, you see very clearly that all the mites uh, come off uh, the bees. Uh, you have to kill the bees in this method, but it can be a, a very accurate, accurate uh, way to, uh, to check uh, your mite count. So this is basically a graph from May till uh, the end of August, uh, where you see the, the mite count very low in the beginning of spring, and then by the end of the summer it starts climbing. Here you see in 2020 in 12 colonies, an average, um, at the bottom, uh, many uh, times we were at zero or one. Then by August you get three mites uh, drop on average. Then it starts going up, um, 31. So then you say, okay, I decide to treat. I use an oxalic acid treatment. Um, and immediately after my treatment, I put my sticky board under it for one day only just to see the effect of the mite drop. And all the mites that drop are dead, so they don't walk away, okay? So from 48, those were the, the mite drops, uh, it goes down, I check again, I have 11, 7, then I go back to 27, okay? Then I treat, then I have 177. This is the average on all the 12 colonies. Okay, so you need to multiply 12 by 177 to get the total amount of mites. And then I drop to 19 mites by the 1st of November, which is still way too high. This is in the spring of 2022, and here you see all the, the, the hives. Um, they have different coats um, because I have them a little bit by, by family. Um, you see that the oxalic, before the oxalic treatment, this is the mite drop that I have on my <coughs> sticky board. Then the third column, um, I treat all the hives at the same day, okay? So uh, I don't exclude not one. And then when I do the drip method, I can see and look into my hives and I can see if on the top I have only three frames of bees or five frames or full ten frames of bees. So I mark weak hive yeah, with a minus or with a plus, two plus or three plus. Three plus is a very strong hive. So you all ready here or have an, an idea when you do this treatment, yeah, what is the condition of your different hives. And then you have the mind count uh, three days later on the 14th of February, and you see that there are some hives that are extremely high, 450, 256, and 692 mites dropping. This is uh, December 9th, just uh, uh, in 2022, and here you see an average of all the mites that have been dropping in uh, 15 hives. Um, and what I did is on December 8th, I treated, or um, yes, I treated with oxalic acid. On the 9th, I counted 955 mites, or 64 mites on average per hive. Then I did on the 19th, or basically 11 days later, I did a second treatment, and I got only a drop of 24 mites, or 1.6 mites per hive. So I dropped from 64, mites per day to 1.6 and then I did another mite check on January 18th and I had only six mites drop in one day on 15 different hives okay, or 0.4 mites per hive and then I calculate my efficiency so basically here you have the numbers so on the 18th of January I could determine that my two treatments of oxalic acids was 99.4% efficient. How many hives do you have in your hive? Uh, the floretic 
in the forensic stage, um, in my personal experience, I calculate the number of mite drops today, I multiply by 67, personal evaluation, but when you have a very reproductive hive in the full summer, okay, 80% of the mites are in the brood cells. Okay, so 20% are only phoretic, and only a few of those will induce a natural drop yeah, when they try to jump from one bee to the other and, and miss the jump and drop down. More natural drop with active colonies, okay, temperature related too. So if you try to check on a cool day when your bees are, 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 are quiet in your hive, you will not get a lot of drop. But today, for example, yeah, is an excellent day with 70 degrees Fahrenheit temperature yeah, to put your sticky boards under the hive and check, you know, the day after what has been the mite count. So what I use are personally acceptable in early spring. On one day drop, I say less than two. In an active highs, in early summer, less than five. In late summer, less than 10. Okay, uh, an active hive with the queen. So here again, uh, lifespan reduction, 50% uh, um, when you have these uh, varroa mites uh, parasiting on the bees and a honey yield loss of 40%. So the control is we can freeze the drone brood. So if you have fray, uh, frames with a lot of drone brood, because the varroa mite prefers the drone brood because it can reproduce much better. Uh, you can take them out, put them in the freezer for 72 hours, take them out, uh, let them get on temperature and put them back in the hive and the bees will clean it out. Then we use soft chemicals. Soft chemicals uh, like uh, organic acids, formic acids, thymol, oxalic acids, um, uh, you normally use 3.5 grams per hive, and uh, I consider after testing a lot of different products of oxalic acid and the drip <coughs> method is the most secure, most safe way to treat hives, also in relation uh, to our uh, own health. But our control with heart chemicals or miticides, uh, they are lipophilic, so the chemicals are absorbed by fat and lipids. Resistance has developed uh, uh, against these miticides when we use them in prolonged use. So normally these miticides are used more by the large uh, bee uh, 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 commercial uh, beekeepers. Uh, the smaller ones normally use soft chemicals. Um, chronic exposure to low doses over time can also affect uh, bee health. Uh, cannot be used during honey flow. So every treatment uh, against the mites, don't try to do it when you have supers. Uh, later on you're going to extract yeah, on your hive. And that is why the treatment against uh, the mites is normally done uh, when you take your supers off and of course when you have most of your uh, mites uh, phoretic, so on top of the bees so that you can really attack them and get a massive drop um, in the count within the hive. So hard chemicals are also absorbed in the wax. Okay, you also don't want to have that because indirectly you could contaminate a little bit uh, your honey. So if you want to produce quality honey, yeah, try to stay away from your hard chemicals. Uh, there are three types of beekeepers. <laughs> the first type of beekeeper is they treat all the time. The second type of beekeepers, they say they don't have mice. <laughs> <laughs> because they never check and count if there is my drop. And then the third ones that really have a steady program uh, checking every month at least once, if possible twice, you know, what is uh, the mite drop, especially going to the end of the summer when normally your mite population is growing uh, very quickly. So I have a consistent program against the Varroa that starts with measuring the mite load. 
Um, genetic process in the selection, uh, everybody has heard about the varroa sensitive hygienic behavior. Uh, the reproduction of the varroa mite uh, um, triggered uh, removal by, by bees. Um, I, have, I have bought some of these varroa sensitive hygienic uh, lines. Um, but I, I can say you, if you have a very productive hive that produces a lot of honey, you can assume that you will have a large load of varroa mite and you will need to uh, treat those hives if you want them to uh, uh, survive. So reproduction of mite is simply more pronounced in these high, highly productive colonies. Selecting for better queens also cover general gentle behavior, low swarming instinct, productivity, and activity based on temperature. At what temperature? 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Do I see my bees coming out of the hives and starting to uh, gather uh, nectar and pollen? Deformed wing disease here very clearly. Uh, John also mentioned it very quickly. So this is one of the viruses that affect our uh, bee colonies uh, because the varroa might uh, contaminate it with these viruses, inject these viruses into the bees and uh, uh, causing uh, considerably damage. So conclusions, the varroa might be strongly parasitic on the European uh, honey bee. Uh, control viral hive diseases by controlling the mites. The mite is an intermediate uh, host for these viruses, so it will uh, transmit uh, these different viruses uh, to the bees. Uh, use entrance reducers to control robbing and drifting bees so that the guard bees at the entrance of the hives can keep uh, drifting bees and robbing bees outside, uh, have good ventilation and a sunspot. Okay, that will help also. Yeah, and of course, have sufficient food sources in the area for strong colonies. That was it. Thank you very much. No, we don't. We don't have any information uh, that that is happening. Yeah. Normal, normally, the normally we don't see. Uh, that uh, within uh, insects that viruses will jump uh, to humans or to other animals, right? Um, not not in the in case of, of, of bees colonies. Thank I've you. never heard about it. Um, uh, you said that you can't use modified strains uh, of the flow, but can you use the organic acid, the um, oxalic acid strains? Can you repeat the question? You said that you can't use mitocides and hard chemicals for yep. honey flow. Well, you can, you can use hard chemicals, but remember, hard chemicals will go into the wax. Uh, hard chemicals are, are very effective, but over time, will, uh, mice will, will be resistant. But the oxalic acid um, is, is a soft chemical. It is, uh, you see, more than 99% uh, effective. Uh, you use, I use the drip method. And when you come to the club and you can go online, you can get much more information. When you use a gasification of acids in your hive, you need to use protective, uh, a protective mask because you cannot inhale those gases. Okay, it's very damaging. Oxalic acid also penetrates through your skin. So uh, we we are talking here um, about. Uh, products that can affect our health, okay? But with the drip method, you have the least exposure. Can you imagine that if you are evaporating an acid on the bottom of your hive, uh, you need to be careful with wind directions, uh, where you stand. Uh, often the evaporation is not very effective, okay? And, and, and you, you have seen here that with the oxalic uh, drip method, uh, per hive, you use 50 ml. Uh, you make uh, this uh, a one-to-one -one sugar uh, water, solu uh, water solution. You add 3.5 grams of pure oxalic acid. It is the cheapest treatment okay, that you can do in your hive. 
that cost cents, not dollars. Okay, you buy hard chemicals and you pay. Okay, so. You need to treat in the winter at least twice. And the reason is in the first in the first time you get 95%. But that last 5% is still way too much. You need to be over 99% so that when you start with having brood in your colony and checking the mite load in early spring, you get zero or one. Now zero doesn't mean there are no mites. There are for sure there are mites. But your count is extremely low. So you start low and you will end fairly low at the end of summer. But if you have too many, 10 mites count in March, way too much, you can have instead of 50 by August, you can have 500 mites dropping. That's the, that's the difference. So the multiplication is, is, is very, very fast. Can you bring your hive back to 500? I, I lost from the 19 hives I have, I lost one. And that one hive had the highest mite count. And I treated probably that hive too late. Okay, and remember, if, 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 if these mites uh, affect severely the hive population, that if you have a hive that goes into the winter with not enough bees, uh, we had some very cold days, if that, if that hive is not warm enough, okay, you could lose your hive. Could you go back a few slides um, to show the spelling of that acid? <coughs> So here you have the, the hard chemicals, and here you have the soft ones. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, and you buy uh, uh, a pound of oxalic acid, and it will cost you $10. And you use only 3.5 grams. So you can treat hundreds of hives, okay? Okay, don't do this. You guys out here at, uh, at a timely manner, but we want to make sure that you get all the information that you came here to get. And I'm here to bring up the tail end about uh, the rest of the hive pests. You've heard about the most uh, destructive pests, grow destructive, but we do want to touch on the other critters in the hive that you will come across. And um, at the end, we're going to have a Q&A panel, so that way our experienced species can come up and answer your questions and their experiences with these pests you can get a well-rounded view of what's going on. And um, also I encourage you to take pictures of my slides. Uh, I like to cram a lot of pictures and information in uh, as well as talking. So be good reference point to do something real quick. When we need to uh, meet that mic. So first off, I want to start off with uh, the small hive beetle and the greater and lesser wax moth. Um, before you really get into anything, these are really considered secondary or opportunistic pests, which means that they only really come in and take out a hive after it's already been affected by other factors. And so, uh, honestly, you can put a pin in it. Your first line of defense is keeping your colony strong, and um, that will help uh, nature take its course in the fact that bees really don't tolerate either of these pests in large numbers in the hive. The garbies do a good job of chasing them out, keeping them out, corralling them, whatever is necessary. And so um, they're really are your first, they are your first line of defense. It is keeping them strong enough to do so. Um, but starting off with small hive beetle, uh, basically that species is from South Africa. They're uh, fruit and nectar feeders. They were found in Florida in around about 1996. And in general, uh, they're scavengers. Uh, your hives, they'll eat anything from your honey to the comb to immature and dead bees, pretty much any organic matter. Um, and their life cycle with small hive beetle uh, completely evolves uh, around the hive. And so adults will um, sneak into the colony and the females will lay egg masses on the comb, uh, sometimes in root comb, and then uh, those larvae will come out and eat anything they can and just cause a lot of destruction in the hive. 
and then when it's time for them to go into the next phase, they'll actually uh, fall outside your hive, pupate in the ground, emerge as adults, and then, hey, here's the hive I just came from, let me go back in and start the cycle all over. And so uh, their main damage is really from the larvae of the small hive beetle. Um, when they're in the hive and they're eating, uh, they introduce the yeast into the honey, and what that does is create something called slime cone, which is, uh, the yeast ferments that honey, and it creates a bunch of smell. I haven't smelled it myself, but I heard it smells like uh, orange peels, the candy orange peels. And uh, secondarily, this smell will actually alert other small hive beetles in the area to say, hey, uh, this hive is on its way out, come on in and do what you need to do. And uh, it's just kind of a cycle that happens from there. And uh, the adults themselves, they can actually fly for several miles on their own. And so uh, I'm technically I'm going to be here from Tallahassee, Florida, and I was back there between there in Gainesville. So beekeepers in Arkansas is definitely different. But um, as you may have heard some beekeepers say, if you don't start off with hive beetles, you're going to have them at one point or another. Um, it's just a part of keeping hives. And so moving on to control is just important to see your options and see what levels you need to ramp up to as that infestation kind of ebbs and flows. So what I like to do is break it down. As uh, first one, uh, level one will be uh, physical control. When you open that hive, uh, you open the lid, you check the top, see if there's strain around there. Uh, your inner cover, as soon as you take that off, that light hits that hive, those bees are gonna go, I mean, those uh, bees are gonna go running around. You wanna use your hive tool, just mash them. Right there, you're in the cycle before it even gets started, so get started hopefully. What I like to do is uh, keep a count, see how many you see from time to time, and that can kind of um, help you kind of gauge how bad of an infestation you might have starting, and it's just a major problem when you need to go to the next level. Uh, so level two, I say would be mechanical control. Um, if you've heard from my other night, um, special bottom boards are really good, especially the uh, Freeman Beetle Trap. Basically what that is, this picture here in the corner, uh, the screen bottom board is kind of bulked up, and it has an, uh, an opening in the back of it so that you can slide a tray in and out. And uh, this is also good for Varroa IPM, using the, the sticky boards that was mentioned earlier uh, for doing those checks because you're going in the back bottom of the hive, you're not disturbing what's going in, or what's going on up top. And uh, basically the way it works is you keep it filled with a kill agent, uh, vegetable oil, mineral oil, soapy water, and uh, diatomaceous earth actually works. Uh, it's a very fine um, material and it actually chops the uh, beetles' legs off uh, very cleanly, but it also kills them. So, uh, the thing about this tray is almost a double-edged sword. So what you want to do is uh, keep your feel for it in order for it to be effective. Because if you let that tray dry out, what's going to happen is uh, the frass, which is uh, insect food, if we didn't <laughs> explain that earlier, uh, frass and other uh, organic debris will fall down through that stream and into that tray. And then with this clump there down at the bottom, and again, being um, organic matter consumers, those beetles and the larvae are just gonna love that and you're gonna just have a breeding station right there under your hive. And so, um, either use it fully and keep it filled or take it out or don't use it at all. And uh, in the winter, you can just close that entrance up in the back and that way you keep that draft down. Um, and also you can use it year round. There's really not a certain time that you should or shouldn't use it. Um, if it's something you wanna implement, definitely keep it going. And so uh, another level two mechanical control would be your in-hive traps. You learned about the beetle blaster and the beetle gel. Um, and basically, you know, how they work is you paint them in between your frames and uh, they pretty much work on an attractant slash kill agent thing. Uh, with your beetle, with your beetle blaster, which are the plastic ones up top, uh, you fill it about a third of the way full with either vegetable oil or apple cider vinegar. And because these insects breathe through spiracles on the side, uh, what it is is a smother kill agent. And so um, it works pretty much both ways with using the beetle blaster. With the beetle gel, it actually, that center compartment here, um, you can put the apple cider vinegar in there as you're attracted and then fill the outer, outer two chambers with the uh, vegetable oil. And so these come in both uh, disposable and uh, reusable versions. Um, I've implemented both in my hives with uh, varying success, but it really comes across as um, in general are in hive traps uh, taking care of the problem. Some beetles get smart, some don't. And so um, another mechanical control that has come up is uh, using dry swimmer cloths uh, commercially. They're called beetle towels. And basically the way they work is you set them on top of your frames in the hive and the bees, what they'll do is they'll shred it up really finely. 
And uh, the beetle's legs are very, uh, very small, and their tarsus will get caught, their tarsus or claws will get caught in that cloth, and basically they starve. They can't move, they can't go anywhere. And so, um, pretty affordable method if it works. Again, um, the bees might not tear up the, the cloth finely enough or something of that nature. And so, it's definitely something worth trying um, as an alternative, alternative or uh, in combination with your uh, in house beetle traps. And uh, level three, I think you really have to ramp it up. The first two kind of don't get the job done. You kind of move into chemical control. Uh, so commercially available is a uh, Check Mike Plus. It has uh, Kumaphos is the insecticide. And they come in strips. In the bottom right here, you have the beetle barn trap, which pretty much works like a, a roast motel kind of way. You'll cut about an inch strip off of your Check Mike Plus, drop it in that beetle barn. And usually you'll put that trap either in your bottom board in the back, or on top of your inner cover. And while the beetles are being chased around and looking for dark places to hide, they'll slip off in here, get that attractant, and then die off. Um, another chemical control is a guard star. And uh, basically, it's a soil trench. And uh, what it does is it sits um, in the soil outside your house. And basically, the kill agent is um, geared towards killing your emerging adults. So it won't kill the larvae going in, but it will kill the adults coming out. Uh, so it's also, it's, uh, when you're looking at chemical controls, these two are the ones you kind of want to start with first because they're the main, uh, main ones to use in a small hybrid control when you're on the chemical level. And uh, fourth, I have to throw this in there, is the biological control. Um, nematodes, around worms, they're, they're everywhere, they're varying sizes, they're, uh, they attack different things. Some are helpful, some are harmful. In this case, uh, these two particular species of nematodes are uh, bee friendly and they actually only attack uh, certain beetle larvae. And so again, you'll mix this, uh, you'll mix them up in a um, soil drench application and uh, they feed off of the uh, small high beetle larvae exclusively. So they'll exist in the soil as long as they have those larvae being uh, basically sacrificed to them. So it's a good application to have. And actually with nematodes, um, we have a source for them in our club, we have a contact that um, we have we have someone still, Jay, that in our club they could get you uh, to supply of uh, nematodes and tell you how to apply them. And uh, also, I found this particular species is available from uh, and from Perry, Georgia. And if you visit their website, uh, they can get them sent to you. They can show you how to apply them. And so uh, these are just two good ways to get a hold of nematodes. If that level four control is something that you're interested in looking into and see if it's a viable option for you. Uh, so just recapping. Um, really starting off with your physical and mechanical controls, having those on hand. Um, if you're not seeing your beetle problem subside <laughs> or if it's growing, definitely step it up to your level three. And um, your level four with biological control, honestly, I think you could probably slip it in somewhere after level two and uh, maybe in combination with um, the other ones as well. And just kind of see what works out for you if your small hive beetles are becoming a problem in your hives that really aren't on the way out, so to speak. So next we have wax moth. Um, just real quick, if you didn't know, the larval stage is the one that actually does the damage. The adults don't feed. They're at the point of their life, kind of like the lunar moth, to the point where they don't eat. They just live, off, live out the rest of their days, uh, lay eggs, and then they die. Um, they're also called wax worms, and uh, I've seen them sold as pet food, reptile food, and bait and things of that nature. So you don't want to keep them around if you haven't used them all up for those activities because they'll find their way into your hives. Um, and so with the pictures here, this again with the larvae, they, uh, just like the small hive beetle larvae, all want, they eat uh, comb, they damage comb. When they're uh, moving around in the hive on their frames, they'll create that uh, silken Silken trail behind them, which is a mess. And um, if there's any if there's any comb that's had pollen in it, has pollen in it, or brood comb, they, they love it. Those are the, the comb areas that they're really drawn towards eating, but they'll eat, they'll just they'll eat your whole frame out. Um, and uh, wax moths in general, again, secondary opportunistic pests, they uh, invade stored comb, which I'll get to. Um, in the middle picture here, um, basically when the wax moths are about to pupate and create those cocoons, They'll actually chew into the size of your boxes, chew into the size of your frames to uh, cocoon and get emerged. And so again, that's just another big mess in your hive. And uh, they'll just create, they'll just continue the cycle 
until uh, you either do something at the bottom or they do something about your feet. So um, we definitely have them as a pest all around in combination sometimes with the small high beetle. And so getting in control with the wax moth, kind of the same thing. Uh, in my experience, when you encounter a light infestation, like you've just seen a couple of frames that have some silk cocoons running around or maybe some, some webbing, um, freezing. Freezing kills insects. What you want to do is you want to freeze those particular uh, frames or maybe even the whole box for a full 72 hours. That's going to kill anything that was moving in there that was an ossipod. Um, after which, you want to take it out and return that box to the colony. And if you've got a strong colony, they'll clean up any mess, any um, remnants of, of wax moth um, presence, and um, they should return to normal in a sense. Uh, but if you have a heavy infestation, what you really want to do is do a combination of freezing and cleaning yourself if you're really trying to hold on to these frames. Uh, so what you want to do is you want to sack everything up because at that point with a heavy infestation, you've got frass everywhere, you've got uh, comb falling everywhere, so you just want to keep that in the sack so it doesn't get in the freezer. Um, and after you froze them for that period, what you want to do is uh, take them out and scrape everything off. If you had uh, frames with beeswax foundation, replace the foundation. Uh, if you have plastic foundation, what you want to do is scrape all the way down to that plastic foundation and uh, power wash it if you want to, to completely clean it. And in some cases, if you kind of want to give the bees kind of a head start to get back to work, um, just reapply some of the bees wax or light coating of it so that they'll take through it a lot quicker um, if that's what they choose to do. And so that gets me to my next point. Level three, honestly, after heavy infestation of wax moths, uh, you should really just kind of start anew because if you have wax moths that create a dead out or a dead colony, the bees are gone, all your framework is a mess, your woodware is a mess, it's just, it's a mess. So the bees also considered a mess in most cases, and um, some of them won't stay around. If you reuse a box that has um, wax moth chewing on the side or frames that are like, um, have the remnants of any type of wax moth activity, um, they might not stick around, you know, they, they might not take that box and they'll swarm or that's gone. Uh, but some of them have stayed around, so it's kind of a give and take. I think the best advice I can give you is to probably start over if you have the resources, just give your bees a fresh start with uh, new material. Um, so in, looking into prevention, we can do a lot of this in Tallahassee, but um, there's a chemical or at least a product out called Sertan, and it's a spray solution of BT. And basically what you would do is you would mix that up and you would just apply it to every frame that you plan on um, putting in your hive. It can have drawn comb, it can be foundation, whatnot. It's just a preventative measure. Um, Another control is uh, fumigation. There's a, there's a product called Paramol that is used if you just want to fumigate your hives and just really um, put, up, put out that, that coating to keep wax moth even for when you even really want to come in. And um, honestly, getting back to dead outs and stored comb, um, you want to properly store your comb. And the best way I can tell you to do that again is the freezer. You've got a deep freezer that you can dedicate to storing. Um, Extra, extra frames that have fully drawn out comb or honey um, that you're not reusing into other hives, uh, put it in the freezer. It will keep, and it will keep um, the insects off of it. And so another technique if you want to get really, I guess, particular uh, is you freeze the frames and then you vacuum seal them. However way you want to um, accomplish that. Um, another way I've seen is that you can actually freeze them and put them in a plastic tote and seal that plastic tote. Seal, seal with duct tape, every entrance, every vein, those ventilations, just seal it up. And um, I don't know the success of that, but in theory, it is um, do, a viable option. Do you re, do you put the tote back in the freezer, or, or you, can, you can freeze it, put it in a tote, seal it, and then just scroll it back? I've seen people just store that without putting it back in the freezer. Um, well, that's a lot of stuff to keep in the freezer. That is a lot of stuff to keep in the freezer. Unless you have walk-in freezer, and then you're, you're probably commercial at that point. Um, another technique I've seen, but I can't really vouch for per se, but maybe other beekeepers have had the experience, <laughs> is to uh, store your frames in the open air with circulation and a lot of light. This picture is of um, frames being hung in the barn, and this is fully drawn out comb, it's honey, and I believe the, the message behind it is that uh, this is winter storage in a place where um, the winters, the winter temperatures are at a point to where insect activity will be uh, little to none, and so that way they wouldn't be active enough to actually get to 
um, your frames, um, do with that information what you will. I would prefer to actually store them somewhere sealed where I know nothing can get in. But uh, this is a, a viable technique in the northern states more than likely. And so with those two guys out of the way, just want to touch on the minor pests, uh, starting with ants. Uh, personally, I feel like ants really aren't a concern until they are. Um, their threat really comes from if you had ants in your bee yard or in your area, uh, you treated, with, treated them with a pesticide, if they find their way to your hive, they could potentially track that pesticide into your hive and more than likely it's uh, detrimental to your bees and so they will they'll end up killing a hive by being in yours. Um, so um, keep that in mind if you are going to um, treat, for, uh, treat for ants and you're keeping your bees in that area. Um, treatment? Treatment for ants, Xavier? Yes. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, not, not treatment for your ants, but um, are you asking about what are treatments for ants, are you? Correct. I personally, you know, anything in the store that will kill ants. Okay. Um, you know, pellets are usually, they'll take them, they'll put on top of your uh, ant mound and they'll take them down to the queen and everybody, everybody dies, like a systematic type of death. Um, but getting into uh, more of a treatment around your hives, uh, ant moats are probably the most viable. And uh, basically, the concept is a cup that has slick sides and it uh, keeps some type of oil or water in it. And if it can come up, fall in, and not be able to come out. Uh, from these pictures, I think the best, honestly, the best message is to have one that has a hood over it. So that way it keeps out rain and debris, and you'll have that um, viable source of your water, your oil, you want it to change it out just frequently. And um, as you see from the right, they can be applied to your hive stands. Uh, they can apply it directly under your hives, and then there are also um, the transportable mobile hive stands on the far right, which is on this side, um, that you can use uh, that already has it incorporated. So you have lots of options, and actually, um, they can 3D print it as well. I've seen a lot of plants with 3D printed ones, so any type of ant mode will keep uh, the ants from crawling up your uh, stand and getting into the hive in the first place. Mice, uh, you've heard about them in there. Basically, they're a winter problem, um, and they are as destructive as in any other stored food scenario. So you don't want them in their hive, you don't want them anywhere around your hive. Um, and like Dr. Lee said, you want to add your mouse guards before your bees start clustering in the winter. That's a good time to put them on. And uh, number eight hardware cloth works. It's a cheap alternative to getting one of the metal uh, mouse uh, guards that um, you have to kind of nail down and whatnot. Uh, but anything, again, as long as bees can come and go, you're going to keep those mice out. Skunks and raccoons and uh, varmints, uh, possums, really anything that's got the, the little hands and uh, <laughs> want to get at, at something sweet. Uh, skunks in particular, uh, they eat bees. They've learned to kind of coax bees out during the night and kind of eat them one by one, more or less. And most have learned that you only eat the front of a bee because the stinger's on the other end. So they will make they will make an effort to, to get at your hives. And uh, with raccoons, uh, they mostly raid your external feeders. That mason jar feeder that you have in the front of your hive. Um, I have a producer that actually had her um, feeder knocked down a couple of times. We weren't really sure why. And I was like, no, it was maybe raccoons because uh, the raccoons get over there and knock it down, see if there's a meal. You replace it again the next day, they'll come back and do it again. And uh, I doubt you'll really catch them in the act. So to kind of keep them from being a problem um, as best you can, you want to keep your hives elevated off of the ground. 18-inch uh, minimum is what I say and what I've learned. Um, and with your, rac with your raccoons, if they're a big problem, you can't get your hives away from them, so to say, you can switch to an internal feeder. Uh, that you learned from a class the other night, you have the uh, feeders that replace frames inside your hive, and so that way there's a concealed box and the raccoons can't get at them. And I doubt they'll make as much effort as a skunk would to try to get in. So um, that's one way to keep the coons out if um, the family of them are waiting for you to put that feeder back on on the outside. Um, put a question mark with bears because. Um, are they a minor problem? I, I wouldn't say maybe an uncommon or common problem is, is where I would kind of categorize it. But if you have bears, especially up here in Arkansas where I've learned uh, black bears, um, you'll want to 
take precautions. And so, um, if you didn't know, bears are going in to eat the bees for protein as well as the honey. I know Winnie the Pooh is kind of popularized just eating honey all the time. But, uh, you know, bees over winter hibernate the tents and they want to bulk up. And bees are full of protein, especially drones. Um, and when they get in, they will just create a tornado of damage, as you see on the bottom left. Um, a lot of the beekeepers that I've talked to that have had bears come through, like not a lot of stuff was salvageable after the bear came through. And unfortunately, um, if they come through one time and set the apiary right back up where it was, they'll come back again because they, they thought that was a successful raid and um, they'll be right back <laughs> with another problem and with the friends. So the best advice I can give you is prevention with an electric fence. Yeah. I've been following uh, scientific beekeeping for a while. And um, it's a very good beekeeping community around the U.S. and the world. And there are states up there for a bear fence that has kind of had um, pretty good success. But basically, if you're not really into electric fence, three or four strands, uh, keep it hot. And uh, hopefully, it will. the bear will get a good pop on the nose and leave it alone. I've heard in some instances they've gotten a pop and ran straight through it. Um, so it's kind of give and take, but uh, I think if you want to protect your bears, it's better to try it um, and have them uh, possibly be deterred to run through. Um, and also I learned that uh, game and fish will actually come out and trap bears on your property, uh, nuisance bears as they call them. I think if a bear came through once, I would consider it a nuisance since I would probably call them up. Because <laughs> um, it's free of charge from what I hear. Um, that electric fence, depending on how many hives you got and how you want to maintain it, could be a bit pricey. What's that fabric around on the bottom? That should be landscaping cloth. Weed stuff. Uh, grass, yeah, because the grass will short it out. Yeah, so mm -hmm. out. Yeah. yeah, like they keep uh, the grass off the wire so it doesn't ground out. Um, more than likely, that's landscaping cloth, uh, especially with three strands, three strand fence. Uh, but those are the pests and. Uh, Eight fifty three. So I would like to jump into honeybee diseases, and luckily I have kind of outlined this to the point where I want to make sure you get the information. I don't want to scare you, uh, but it's important to be informed. So I'll go through this again. I encourage you to take pictures, and we'll have questions at the end, and you'll be able to reach any of us. Recorded too. Okay, we'll also uh, record it too. It'll be up on the website, so all the resources for you to get your questions answered uh, will be available to you. Uh, so as we know, uh, diseases are primarily caused by bacteria, fungi, and viruses. And so I want to start with bacterial diseases. You've heard about foul brood uh, off and on. And so there's American foul brood and there's European foul brood. And I just want to touch on American foul brood because it's the more chronic and destructive of the two. Um, with American foul brood, it's caused by spore-forming bacterium, and they affect the larval and the pupal stages of the and so characteristically, what happens is um, the spores will infect the larvae and kill it. And then that dead larvae will actually degrade into like a dark, soupy mess. And so what we do is we do something called the match test, where uh, you take the end of a match and you dip it off in the comb. And if you can pull out a string of material that you see in that top picture, you probably got American foul food. Um, and so the way it will go through and destroy a colony is uh, nurse bees clean out cells when a bee is born, when they found diseases of varroa, things like that. And so uh, the larval bodies that are dead will actually uh, harden and turn into the scale, and this is full of bacterial spores. And so the nurse bees, when they go through cleaning, they'll rupture those scales, get them all over their body, and then just transfer, transfer spores throughout the hive as they're trying to clean, they're also infecting. And so with that, American foul root can just decimate the colony because bees are working as they naturally would for their um, secondarily spreading spores. And so American foul brood, the only control for it is burning of infected hive, complete burning of everything that's infected. And I say this because uh, state inspectors do not play. I've talked to state inspectors in about four or five different states and uh, it's written everywhere. American foul brood is not tolerated in any colony that you have registered. It is found when they um, inspect your hives, the, the, the order is to burn. And so, um, with it being again that more chronic disease, this is the way to keep it under control and keep it from spreading. Uh, in very rare cases, um, antibiotics, uh, tetracycline products can be used to treat American foul brood, but that is only allowed under state inspectors' advisement. I've never heard of these special cases, but it is possible. 
um, they would have to be there or have a licensed veterinarian here to apply that um, in that case for whatever reason you're trying to save that college mm -hmm. that much. Um, and just a quick note about European foul brew. Um, it's curable uh, and has similar symptoms to American foul brew. It still affects the laws in future stages. But um, it's curable with Ketocyclic and Palatin. I was actually gifted a hive before I left Tallahassee that had recovered from European foul brew. And um, they did pretty well. The disease didn't come back. Um, and the bees, you know, return to, to good health. But American power Brew is the one you got to watch out for and um, definitely take care of it when it arises. So we'll touch on right quick on the fungal diseases, uh, chalk root and stone root. I haven't encountered these personally myself, but uh, basically with them being um, fungi, they kill the larvae from the inside and they create uh, mummies, if you will, just really hard um, kind of um, degraded bodies of people, and they can be various colors, <coughs> white ones, gray ones, green ones, black ones, and so forth. And then fungi also uh, allow other fungi to come in to just have a bunch of different spores going on. But, um, and I guess symptoms of anything that you'll notice is along with seeing certain patterns in the hive, like the top picture, the second picture is actually of the mummies that were dragged out of the, uh, the brood chamber, and they're coming on the landing strip on the front of the hive. So if you see these mummies, uh, outside the hive or inside, uh, it's possible to have one of the uh, root diseases. Uh, the thing about them though is they can be phased out with a strong collagen, just uh, the collagen going through being very hygienic and um, if the ever flow of the seasons it might be something that will clear up on its own in a sense. Uh, but with chalk root, if it's reoccurring, like it reoccurs every spring or something like that, uh, what you'll want to do yourself personally is replace the woodware and your foundation and uh, sterilizer your hive tools as well because we mentioned that um, diseases and things can be uh, transferred via the equipment that you use. Um, and so again with stone brew, another fun guy, uh, the thing about stone brew is the larvae become very hard and um, so if you're out there squeezing to see which one you have that might be a characteristic um, is that one is harder, one um, mummy is harder than, than the other. Uh, no semen. You ever heard about Nosema? Now it's the time to hear about it. Um, it kind of stinks under the radar in some instances because the symptoms aren't, they aren't hard symptoms like, they aren't the symptoms that are just, okay, I know I have Nosema. They could be attributed to other factors, but uh, it is caused by microsporidian parasites, um, again, spore forming, and uh, they live in the digestive tract of the bees, and so those spores are actually transferred um, through the mouth of the bees. And so the first thing I really look out for if I think you no know, semen is around is uh, diarrhea, <laughs> diarrhea and dysentery over here. Uh, so it's like light diarrhea and then that's, that's, that's full blown. Uh, if you have this on the outside of your hive, um, take note of it and start to look for other symptoms because it may be indicative that you have a problem and that problem may be no semen. Um, another thing um, that was probably mentioned throughout the night is uh, you want to pay attention to how your bees act. You know, how they look and how they act. Uh, with Nosema, um, I've seen bees that have swollen or uh, really greasy appearance to their abdomen. Uh, they do a lot of trembling. It's not the bee dance, it's, it's more of a tremble. You, you notice a difference in their behavior. Um, and then dead bees in front of your hive, I mean, that's never a good indication of anything, but in combination with these other factors, it will kind of help you diagnose uh, these symptoms that it may be Nosema. Uh, and what they what it directly affects basically is um, the nurse bees. They don't fully develop, so if you don't have nurse bees, you don't have babies being born properly. Thus, the population decreases and the colony starts to fail. Um, and then the infected queens with Nosema they die prematurely. Some queens live up to three to five years. Um, if they get Nosema, she might die the first year. And so, no queen. And if they can't requeen due to other factors, there goes your colony. Um, but obviously when it comes to diagnosis of Nosema, to see if you really have it, you have to do a microscopic examination of the gut contents. Uh, this is something that's known with a high power microscope. Um, usually professionals like Cooperative Extension, um, universities will have these facilities um, and you'll be able to either send out samples or they'll come and get them and they'll be able to give you an average score count to see if you have uh, Nosema disease in your colonies. And when it comes down to treatment, there are two products called Fumadil B and Nosevit. Basically, uh, they're feed supplements. So you'll uh, put them in your liquid feed, your one-to-one. -one. 
or something like that. And the main objective is to decrease the spore count within your bees to help them recover from those things. Um, I can't really speak to the efficacy of these products, but they have been on the market for a while, so they work in some manner. Yes. Would that be a good idea for a preventative treatment? In theory, I would say so, but because I don't know the uh, the origin of the two chemicals, they might interact differently with something else. And for them in bees, you know, you have to be uh, cognizant of you know honey flow, non honey flow, brood, brood rain time, things like that. Uh, but usually, with any of the uh, chemical treatments I mentioned, there are specific instructions that come with them, um, and so that way you'll be able to follow them properly and not do damage to your bees when you're trying to treat them for a specific illness. Uh, and to wrap up, honestly, uh, I could talk enough 30 minutes about the viral diseases. Uh, when I was studying in my master's in entomology, there were about 18 that were identified at the time that affect domestic honeybees. And um, as you heard from my earlier presentation, uh, varroa mites are vectors of diseases, uh, mainly disease here, about six or seven, um, are direct, directly come from being introduced into the bee system through uh, varroa mite contact. And so, um, just to kind of sum it up, I think if you keep your mite load down, you will also be assisting in keeping that viral load down. Um, and I do believe in the future, I'll probably be holding some workshops on the rest of these diseases and application methods, uh, so that if you want to be more informed, uh, we'll definitely have that for you. And so, in conclusion, I just want to say that, again, just like in the beginning, you want to keep your hives strong and healthy. That's your first line of defense. Make sure they have a clean source of water. Uh, make sure they have good food sources. They're not um, getting anything from a uh, runoff from a power plant or you know, something like that. <laughs> um, your onion, um, Dr. C talked about other plants that like bitter weed and things like that. Um, that's more of a fix of honey, but um, just make sure they have good sources of those main things. If you are the steward, you are the beekeeper, you just want to make sure that you're doing good uh, applicate. Um, another thing I want to uh, mention is that you want to monitor for your pests at the proper time. Make sure you monitor for varroa, because uh, like we said, <coughs> some people say I don't have varroa, and, and some people just don't believe they're a thing or a problem in their colony until it's too late. And uh, that goes for the mites, the small hive beetle, like I said, check them. Uh, whenever you open up your hives, take note of if, if they're in there, how many are in there. Um, and again, as you get to know your bees, uh, one thing a beekeeper taught me growing up, my mentor, is uh, we talk to our bees. If you haven't started, I believe you will, especially if you start with like one or two colonies. I name the queens, uh, I go out there and sit with them and everything. And I think with that comes when you're inspecting, you really do get a feel for what's going on in that hive. Maybe taking the same time every day and uh, you notice something different. Uh, you know, take weather, you know, as a variable, or uh, maybe something in the neighborhood might have started them up, but if you can eliminate those variables and get down and you start <coughs> noticing the symptoms that I mentioned from these diseases, you'll be able to jump on a quick bag to help um, get them out of that rut. Uh, and also, I definitely say reach out to mentors. Um, our Beekeeping Association has a lot of mentors, a lot of knowledgeable people willing to help and come out. I know I'm definitely willing to come out and, and take a look and talk to you at any time of day. Um, our club members, uh, state inspectors, I had a scrolling slide up of our two state inspectors. I'll put that back up at the end for you. Um, the Walking Extension, these videos that you have seen for, from Dr. John Z. He is a very knowledgeable person, as you see, and he is the only guy in the state with extension that does this. And um, if you reach out to him, like I said, he'll get back to you and he'll be able to inform you and help you out with a lot of things as well. Uh, and finally, I feel like you should definitely prepare for your treatments beforehand. Always have small hive beetle traps on hand, have you some varroa mite strips, have you some check mite, uh, just in case. Um, and also, any of the other treatments, if they're storable, you know, we keep medicine cabinets human. Uh, keep a message cabinet for your bees. Um, you never know what's going to come up, come up or what's going to be available. I've seen prices fluctuate on several treatments from time to time, so I think it's really good to have those on hand so that way um, you can get right to the problem. And that is all I have. Thank you for your time. Right quick before we start the Q&A session, I just want to mention that our, month, our monthly meetings are every second Monday of the month, like the one coming up, and they're from 7 to 8.30 in the County Extension Building, which is 
that way across the street, right, right, right past the building in front of them. And um, again, you can find more information um, on these trainings and future trainings in the email that you signed up and on our website, nwabsecrets.com. Um, and if you'd like to see email updates, uh, you just log into our website and we'll have that out to you um, periodically. And um, yeah, are there any questions at this time? This is 906, so we definitely have time for that. And otherwise, I would like to thank you for participating. And uh, we hope to see you at the next week. And thank you. 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 Thank you.